So no one told you life was gonna be this way. Your job's a joke, you broke, your love life's the way. It's like you've always stuck in second gear. When it hasn't been your day, your week, your month, or even your year. But I'll be there for you. When the rain starts to fall, I'll be there for you. Like I've been there before, I'll be there for you. Cause you're there for me too. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Your claps were out of sync. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the claps uh, maybe could have used some work. Uh, this is now going to be a new theme of the uh, Buttermash podcast it- intro. I'm going to encourage interactivity, so prepare yourself. You want some audience participation? Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to s- just stop for a moment and let the, let the audience out there sing along at home. We can have the, we can have the lyrics along the bottom and a little bouncy ball on the top <laughs> to tell people how to sing. Hey, this is this is our interactive version of Shatneroki. It's button masheroki, I think, or something. I don't know. I I haven't actually done Rocket Man by William Shatner yet. That's is that a special event? I don't know. It could be. Do you want to make it a special event? Yeah. Well, when I don't know, a big game comes out, Portal <laughs> Three or something. <laughs> You're going to perform William Shatner's rendition of Rocket Man to celebrate Portal 3, okay. Yeah, I think that's appropriate. <laughs> that's a little strange, but okay. I think surely it should be for, like, when they release some sort of Star Trek game. Will they ever do another Star Trek game? Well, they've done a few Star Trek games, so presumably they're would be more to come and you know it's not like it's an ip that people ignore you know if someone says hey we're doing star trek people tend to go "Ooh, star trek because it's star trek you know attack of nimoy attack, yeah that, that that's that's what's coming yet yeah, next yeah nimoy's rest, revenge rest in peace spot <laughs> well okay uh so welcome to the Mash podcast uh, we would talk about video games and video game accessories and Leonard Nimoy. Yep. Well, and various other Star Trek actors because they're relevant to our interests, I think. Maybe. <laughs> I have never seen any Star Trek, so... What? With no How next generation. Gone? I'm not even a fan and I've seen them all. <laughs> I'm not a fan, I just marathon them. <laughs> I just like the idea of you just sitting in a chair being forced to watch Voyager and going, damn it! I don't even like this. I don't know why I'm watching this, but I'm going to watch all of them. That's what unemployment does to you. I'm that unemployed, I still never... I, I'm unemployed, I still have never thought to myself, you know what I should do in my day? I should watch all of the Star Trek. Did you ever have Channel 5? But yeah, Channel 5 is one of like, the default ones in the UK, you know? It's not like it's a hard channel to get. That's, like, the only interesting thing to watch during the day. Or it used to be, anyway. You I never think... discovered Dave. <laughs> yeah, D- Dave Dave is a big one for the unemployed markets, as I found last time I had TV, which I guess would be three to four years ago at this point. I haven't watched TV since then. I never bothered with a TV license or anything. The TV is very, very dusty in the corner of a room that nobody goes in. So, yeah, uh, TV's not big in my life these days. <laughs> uh, and before that, yeah, it was a Dave, Dave was it. It was Top Gear and uh, Friends, actually, was probably a big part of it, I think. <laughs> from Friends 10 was... years ago. Yeah, yeah. Friend, friends from 10 years ago, Scrubs and Top Gear. On loop, because Dave, why not? Because that's exactly how Dave does his programming, <laughs> on loop. Here's three episodes on loop all day long. They, like, they had they had Red Dwarf at one point. Uh, they, they yes, still they have had a dwarf. They they didn't make the latest one, did they? Yes. Yeah, it was uh, Dave. Was version. that Dave put the money up for that one? Did they? Yep. Oh, okay. Because it wasn't shit, so that surprises me. <laughs> <laughs> it was well, a little bit shit. Well, they did the three part one, which suddenly turned into Coronation Street halfway through for like no reason. Which was atrocious. That which was pretty was bad. Kind of half Blade Runner, half Coronation Street. I, yeah, I don't it just know got what. Ve- it just got very, very weird. 
I don't know what that was. And then the then they actually there was the actual series series, which was actually pretty decent. So I don't know. Is it you that was uh, Michael? Is it you that told me they're working on another one? Allegedly, yes. I was gonna say I recall someone telling me it's like, oh, there's another one coming. I was like, I've not heard this from anyone but you. I mean, I'd just be Davy Jules on Twitter going, it's happening. <laughs> And there's just your interpretation of new Red Dwarf series in filming. Or did he specifically say that? Or was it, was it literally just two-word tweet that just said, it's happening, and you just totally interpreted it to mean that? <laughs> what else well, could be happening? Um, He's joining Coronation Street. He could be joining Coronation <laughs> Street, yes. <laughs> yes. Red Dwarf crew take over Coronation Street. Hey, they're not doing anything else. No, well, is Scrappy Challenge still around? No, disappointingly so. So, Robert Llewellyn's not up to much. Chris Barry, get him in there. Chris Barry, Lord only knows what he's doing. He did some big machine stuff a while back, but I don't think that's still been commissioned for a 20th series. I like the fact that we've... Uh... I've not been on these podcasts for a month and I'm back after about five minutes of already hideously off topic. Oh, no, I, mean, I mentioned this last week. <clears throat> I've always got, I got a little wager with myself. Was like, how long can we drag it out before we can actually, you know, start talking about video games each week? All right. So, so, oh, there's a wager. Well, no way. I, I just, not wage. It may as the wrong word for it, but I, I like to see how long we can go before we actually talk about anything useful to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like that, actually. I what think we managed nine minutes one week. Oh dear God, what were we talking about? I don't know. We're only up to seven so far. So if you want to talk about Red Dwarf a bit longer, I'm fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> See if we can get 15 minutes of crap at the start. I wonder why we have no views. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, that's not true, but okay. <laughs> I think people like this kind of entertainment. I hope they do. If you like this kind of entertainment, leave us a message in the comments below. Oh, we, oh, we're soliciting comments now. <laughs> Why not? Why not? It, it, actually... audio, audience participation. Hey, it's because you took away my segues. Right. <laughs> That's it. We replaced segues with audience participation. There we go. Podcast evolution right there before your eyes. No That's crystals it. involved. <laughs> right. We've grown from a squirtle to a war turtle. Pure, pure XP right there. Yeah, something like that. I imagine that's how that works. We've been 50 Ratatars. And now, what's this? The Button Mash podcast is evolving. Hey, we've got it back on video games. <laughs> Sweet. We kind of, well, we, I think we touched on it briefly, didn't we? And then immediately went off topic. But hey, yes, welcome to the Button Mash podcast. Video games are a thing. They're something we talk about. Video games and video game accessories. Should we start things? What's everyone been playing this week? What have you been doing? Go on, Michael, you've been away for a month. What have you been up to? Uh, due to the fact that I had a horrible, horrible illness and uh, several technical things, I haven't actually played anything uh, game-wise, but uh, I have been doing a little bit of tabletop, so I'll tell you about some of the games I've been playing. Alrighty. Uh, one that I've quite enjoyed is called Soro. Has anyone heard of this? Doesn't ring any bells, no. I'm not familiar with that. It's, uh, quite, it's quite simple, really. It's um, You're basically a dragon and you're lighting your path across a game board but you've got to avoid crashing into other players or going off the board what's this called soro soro yeah how do you uh, spell that it's t-s-u-r-o it sounded like it had a silent t and then i was like is the, i don't know because it's silent it's very hard to tell <laughs> <laughs> it's japanese uh so i'm seeing oh interesting art okay yeah it's uh it's not the most technically challenging game in the world but um we had quite a bit of fun with it so. Because it does get quite tactical because tactical, you've got to work out where you're going and how you can F other people over. Alright, so you, are you all trying to navigate your own ways across the board somehow? And you're basically trying to be the last person on the board. Okay. So do you like have to move the tiles around to change the paths and things? Is this how this works? Basically, yeah. in the game board you've got tiles, so you're putting down tiles and mm -hmm. that dictates where you can move. Yeah, okay, like I said, I'm looking this up on Google Images now, so yeah, you've got a big grid of tiles with various lines scrawled all over them, and obviously some of them are just kind of... I, I, do they, some of oh. them are useless, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, some of them are useless, some of them... I'm not seeing any that are like dead ends, though, so do you have to like only move tiles where they can fit or something, or...? No, generally you get 
the lines match up so you don't have too many problems with it. Oh, so. actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I see, yeah. Every every tile has eight lines going into it somewhere, and you... Okay. Yep, so. it, it is a tangled mess of wires, but hey. Well, when you put one down, then um, the other player has to follow the path that you've put down. Right. So, yeah, it's, it gets very tactical. And it's a, it's a fun 10-minute game for anybody that's interested in that kind of thing. Looks intriguing. Cool. I have played something very similar to this, where it was set in a labyrinth, a little bit more D&D style. I uh, think I remember this, but I can't remember what the name is. No, I forget the name entirely. This is way, way back in my youth. Yeah, I know what you mean. All right. Anything else of uh, note in the board gaming world? Yep. Uh, we played a game that I think we played spectacularly horrible. It was called uh, House on Haunted Hill. House on Haunted Hill. I'm going to have to look for this one as well. I think that's Familiar with the movie. Yeah, I think that's what it was called. Um, it's it's quite open-ended, actually, because basically you play four characters that were exploring a haunted house. And eventually you walk in and you can get omen cards, which begin the omen. And then uh, the haunt begins and one of you is revealed to be a traitor who's trying to work against the other players. We then all have to work together to try to defeat the one player. But because of the number of options that you've got on the game, you can have up to about 50 haunts, I believe. So you've got 50 different games. Is this... Are you sure? Is that the name? Hmm. When I, when I put House on Haunted Hill game into Google, it's brought up like a million links for Betrayal at House on the Hill. Yep, that is the name of the game. That's the I one, apologize. right. Okay. <laughs> yep, so I may have been slightly wrong there. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say House on Haunted Hill, yeah, it just brought up a, well, actually brought up two movies. Apparently, I guess they made it like a while back the and one, then remade it. Yeah, the remake had Liam Neeson in and Catherine Zeta Jones in. I know nothing about either, so okay. It was not very good. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> so is this uh, oh, is this one of those kind of... It's one of these things... Is this like a betrayal kind of thing? It seems to be kind of the in thing at the minute. Games yeah. where you betray people. Yeah, I think this is um, a couple of years old, so... Uh, 2004, according to Board Game Geek. Yeah, so I'm slightly right. <laughs> yeah. Ten years old-ish. Yeah, but I, I do like the options with it, because... Um, I think in the game that we played, we had to take out an alien invasion. Don't ask me what that has to do with ghosts. It was just in there. <laughs> Alrighty. So, it's a little, I guess it's kind of got similar kind of elements to things like your werewolf or mafia or yeah, whatever, it's... Town of Salem. Pick one, they're all pretty much similar. Yeah, it's, um, it's very... You've got lots of different options with it, um, and there's certain amounts of strategy because you've got to work out who can... Who could work water when you lose health, you lose sanity, and things of that nature. Okay. We played it horrendously wrong, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So, yep, we won when we weren't supposed to win, so. Cool. Well, that's always the best time to win. I died, though, so I'm keeping up with my form. <laughs> I'd be intrigued to try that. I mean, like, I like that kind of thing. I mean, like I say, it does seem to be kind of in thing at the minute, the kind of thing where, oh, one player is a bad guy, but you don't know they're a bad guy. You must out them and kill them and stuff. Yeah, there's um, a game, I believe, called uh, Dead of Winter, which is kind of similar to this, but it's a zombie game. Oh, right. That, that, looked, um, that does look uh, quite entertaining. Not so one player is secretly a zombie, but he's pretending to fit in with society. No, it's not quite that. <laughs> um, <laughs> no? There's different options where one of you can be the traitor but um, it doesn't always come up into the game so you never quite know so you're playing it slightly paranoid oh right okay um, I've heard people talking about uh, I think the Battlestar Galactica game has a similar Ooh, elements yeah. yeah that sounds good yeah apparently like one player is a Cylon but it, and uh, but oh, wow. not but not always so you sometimes you're trying to find out who's trying to betray you but it turns out nobody's trying to betray you and so you can end <laughs> up like putting someone in a, in an airlock for like no reason yeah this is kind Brilliant. of similar <laughs> this is kind of similar in the sense that you can send like people off onto missions where they will die <laughs> right <laughs> okay sending people out for food into zombie haunted places so. sweet yeah. so what was, what was that one called then I think it's called Dead of Winter, I believe. Very expensive. 
Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's very new coming out, so I think it's about 40, 50 quid at the moment. Yeah, it's 40 quid on Amazon. All right. Why I haven't played it yet? Uh, yeah, it only came out last year. But yeah, that's uh, one to play, hopefully. All right, interesting. Cool. Sounds good. I do, I mean, you've mentioned on a few occasions, I really feel like we should do, like, some sort of live stream with these kind of things on. I'd uh, love that. I think that would be very entertaining. I think Fiasco is a definite, oh my god, this is not going to work kind of thing for that. Well, the one, uh, I don't know, actually, because the one thing I keep toying with the idea of whether it would work is a uh, tabletop simulator. Oh, which right, I yeah. think is on sale slightly this weekend as well, actually, on Steam. I think it's like 30% off. Uh, which, to be honest, it's mostly just the framework for playing. It's literally just a tabletop, and you're allowed to put in whatever cards and dice and things you need to play on a tabletop, and it just lets you move them around. It's like, the game doesn't constrain you to rules or anything, because you're playing by whatever rules you've got on the table. You're expected to know the rules of the game you're playing. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I've not tried it. I mean, I know ages back when they first, like, launched it, they posted on, like, the Let's Play subreddit and was like, hey, Let's Players, does anybody want to play our thing? It's it's a tabletop simulator and here's free Steam keys to anyone who wants it. And I remember looking at that at the time and going, like, what possible purpose could that serve? I don't, I'm not interested in this. No, wait, no, I'm not going to even bother, even going to bother with this. That's silly. Don't be ridiculous. And now everybody's playing it and going, oh my God, this is so good. And you can play like anything. It's amazing. This is fantastic. And I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> so, All those steam keys that you ignored. Yes, I know. I could I could have said, hey, I want to play your game, but I didn't. Uh, never mind. Uh, still have to. We'll have to have a look at that in the, some point in the future. I mean, that game's kind of interesting because a lot of people are sort of. It's some people are saying it's toys that t uh, toes the line of piracy, basically. Because I think if you go into like the Steam Workshop and stuff, you can just download various card games and board games and things as kind of like just community-made DLC packs for it. Yeah. So you can just like, oh, somebody's got. Cards Against Humanity. I'm just going to download Cards Against Humanity and then we'll just play it in Tabletop Simulator. So that we have a table to play Cards Against Humanity on without having to sit around a table. And I know there's web versions and even a mobile version coming out soon of that, but that was just for example. And I think if you, if you basically you just can just scan the cards on a scanner and import the pictures into it and it'll stick them on cards and there you go. There you go, there's a deck of cards. Play with the cards now. You've got all the pictures from the cards and it's like... That's very, very, very close to piracy. Some people are kind of like, is, is this okay? I don't know. That's a really, really, really grey area. They're walking the line slightly with that, I would say. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, I feel like in a lot of cases, it, it's mostly there to appeal to people who have already bought the game and have the game, but don't find enough opportunity to play those games with their friends like... We often find, I mean, I've got two versions of Flux, and I, I love Flux, but how often do we actually genuinely get the chance to play it? Not often is the answer. I, play, I know I played a ton at PAX, but PAX was a great environment for that kind of thing, but oh, well, any yeah. other time... We had a couple of games on Friday. We did have a couple of games on Friday, but, you know, ignoring PAX, when was the last time we played Flux? And that was a very, very long time ago, I think. Yeah, it's been a while. Hmm. So that's the sort of thing I'd be like, you know what, if I, if I could just get my deck of Cthulhu Flux and put it in Tabletop Simulator, and we could just chill out on Twitch and just have a couple of beers and play Cthulhu Flux with each other. That sounds like a fairly interesting project to do, I think. Well, I'd be up for it if you wanted to uh, get it off the ground. and uh, I wanted to, to explore in piracy. Yep. <laughs> well, yeah. I think I say, again, I've bought, I bought the game. So is it is it piracy <laughs> if I've bought the game? It's the, it's the same kind of territory as emulation at that point. It depends how many people you share it with, I guess. Uh, yeah. Yes, if you put it up onto Steam and people start downloading it, then yeah, yeah. they're potentially pirating the game. But I think for, from a personal perspective, it's literally making a digital backup of your game, which is the kind of the same argument you use for emulation and ROMs. It's like, oh, I, I'm, I'm not pirating this copy of Sonic the Hedgehog. I had a Mega Drive back in the day and a cartridge with it, and that's like in my attic somewhere, and I can't be bothered getting it out. I'm just going to <laughs> emulate it. It's like, it's not piracy because I already bought the game and I already own the game. I'm just making a digital backup of my game. A similar kind of argument can be made for this, I would have said. But I think it's uh, certainly an area of personal taste and preference as to whether one thinks that actually constitutes piracy or not. 
I don't know. Especially when you consider that there isn't, an, there isn't a digital alternative to it available. You can't just go out and download a copy of Flux, because that's not how Flux works. If they were just like, here's Flux the video game, well, that would be an entirely different matter. At that point, suddenly, Tabletop Simulator, and you're like, oh, we're just going to play Flux through Tabletop Simulator. Well, that's kind of piracy, when, you know, you could just buy Flux the game. But you can't. So, I don't know. Grey areas. Very, very grey areas. So grey. So very, very grey. Indeed, I mean... Shopping I at Ikea. Yes. <laughs> there is a video game about Ikea. But I went over that a while ago. I imagine there's about five, man. <laughs> <laughs> probably, yes. Probably. Oh, the clones. So many clones. Cloning is video games these days. So yeah, let's. Uh, we need to. We need to make strides in the direction of making that kind of stuff happen. Although, as I've said before, I think the biggest hurdle to that is my internet speed, and I'm still working on trying to get that improved. My landlord is not forthcoming with help on that one. Well, if a uh, good friends of this podcast uh, would be interested in that, please do let us know. And Absolutely. Let, and yes. Give us some ideas on uh, what you'd like to see us play. Tell us. Tell us what you want to see in the comments. Absolutely. And where can people go to post that comment? Sorry? Well, uh, guys, scroll my segue. down. Scroll down the page is where they can go, yeah. My segues. <laughs> we told you, no. No more segues, audience participation instead. You can't have both. You can't segue into audience participation. I can and I will. <laughs> <laughs> it won't work. You can't combine the things. It's never been done before. Science says it can't happen. Nothing is impossible, according to science. And that's how the neutrinos are mutating. <laughs> there, are un- there are unfortunate consequences to nothing being possible. <laughs> uh, any other board games? Anything else of note? Nope, I'm playing Pandemic next week, this, this coming week, so I'll let you know how that goes. Ooh, okay. Because we've had that for a while, or one of our number has within Button Mash, and they brought it to all our events, but I've never played it, so... No, I don't think anyone's played it. I think we just own no. it. <laughs> we just own it, no one's played it, right? That sounds it's about just, right. We're just admiring the box. <laughs> well, I think Johnny owned Boss Monster for freaking ages, and at PAX was like the first time we've ever had an opportunity to play that as well, and it turned out it was actually really good. I think yeah, he played like one two-player game of it once ages ago and it's just been sat gathering dust since and it's like it turns out it's a really good game it's just dungeon keeper the card game and it, it's it's similar in a similar vein to flux it can get surprisingly complex at first you're just like oh the 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 heroes are coming into my dungeon and they will either die or live and i get points re- get, uh, accordingly uh, but no, by the time you get later on into the game, it's actually, you're actually combining cards in really interesting and new and, and exciting ways. And you're like, oh, well, this this hero goes into this room and takes some damage here, then he goes into this room, but then I spring a trap on him, and the trap makes him move back two, day, two rooms through the dungeon. And then I will hit him with a fireball spell, which deals an extra three damage. And then uh, someone else will be like, oh, no, I fear him out of the dungeon, and he returns back to the town, and suddenly it's really interesting. Yeah. We'll uh, have to get a game of that going. Hmm. Tabletop simulator. Maybe. Piracy! <laughs> so, no, uh, digital backups. Oh. Uh, not piracy, but... Kind is. Justifying piracy. Or something. I think that's what we're doing. Pirate yeah, Flux. <laughs> Pirate Flux, yes. That, that game is entirely about stealing things from people, so... I don't see what the issue is with stealing the game from the people who made the game. Logic. Sure. Let's go with that. That makes sense. If you if you bamboozle somebody, you can get away with anything. Indeedy. So what have you been playing this week, Will? Uh, mostly, I've only had opportunities to play today. So I had a really big stint in an early access title called Hawkin. Oh, the mech thing. Yeah, I like that. Is that still early access? I thought that was out by now. Well, it's been early access since February last year. Right. I thought it'd been around longer than that, actually, to be fair, because I feel like I've seen it for like a good couple of years or so now. 
But I'm I'm enjoying the mindless shooting of other mechs. And I'm actually pretty good at it, so yeah, thumbs up to me. Oh, fair enough. You're Are in they the sporting clap. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. That is only to be done during song time. Designated song time. Uh, so, are they actually supporting it well? Is there like uh, like lots of updates to it, or is it one of these early access things that seems to have just uh, like I say, I've not. It's been around, but I because I've not heard any news. I figured it just kind of come out and been done, and that's it. It was out and done, and nobody had done anything with it. Well, it's been in my library for ages, and I've only just sort of brought it up today. Uh, it's still got tons of customizer customizable options in it, and it's still got quite a big player base, so I'm guessing it's supported pretty well. I'm just trying to find... Steam's always really weird. Some, sometimes you go onto the front page of a game and it'll like, oh, here's all the updates that it's had recently. They did an update two weeks ago, and then they did an update a week ago, and then sometimes you go on a page and it'll be like, hey, this game's not finished, why don't you buy it? And it's like, no, I want to know what they're doing with it. <laughs> and in this particular instance, it's the, I want it, it's... Yeah, I just want to know what they're doing with it, and it's not telling me. Well, that, well, that's the mystery that Steam is trying to present to you. You have to buy to find out. Well, it's free to play, so you don't even need to buy it. There you go, you've got no excuse now. Well, true, that's not, well... It's, we know full well free to play doesn't mean free to play these days, come on. It's <laughs> not even that bad for, the, for, for a free to play, because you can earn everything in-game, so... As far as I've encountered so far, maybe some of the, some of the more extreme you know, skins are, are in-game currency. But maybe if you want to buy a hat, that's when the money comes in. Mechs in hats make it happen. <laughs> I'm kind of looking. I'm trying to find out what's happening with the game because uh, if you go onto their news, not that devs are necessarily good at using the Steam news page, and I know a lot of devs are really bad about never posting anything on there, but the last updates for this game are like August last year. Seems, so not... seems slightly a while ago. Yeah, that's a little while. I'm looking on the discussions, I can't find anything. You'd expect them to have like patch notes and stuff if there was any updates to be like, oh, we're up to update 72, here's what's in update 72. Um... There's nothing... The news and announcements forum... Um... Oh, crap. When was this? Was this, like, recently? Apparently, the developer who's making the game has changed, like, a few days ago. Oh, right. Like, one week ago, Reloaded Games takes over development of Hawken announcement. Ooh. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe update's imminent, then. Maybe. Well, I hope so. Um, that's not a that's not a positive positive announcement to put out during the middle of your <laughs> development though. Uh, yeah, we didn't we can't finish it. Someone else is going to finish it for us. Is not kind of what you want to hear from a developer. You know, what, as as is, I like this game. It doesn't really need to change much. To be, if if that's the case, then that's fair enough. Because I mean, plenty of games are like that. That's, a, that's generally what people recommend with early access. It's if the game is good enough to buy now, buy it now. That's fine. Not that you have to buy this, but you know you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. With yeah, something like Prison we're, we're Architect, following. Prison Architect is not finished, but most people would say it's finished enough. If you want to play, if you want to buy it and play it now, you're going to get a very good experience out of it. There is a there is gameplay. There is plenty of features, and there is a end state. The game can be won or lost. Well, lost to be fair, it's that kind of <laughs> game. But it, it's management. It's you keep playing until everything fails on you. So. That's a very bleak view of management you have. <laughs> well, in well, if so, you were a football manager. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is true. It's yeah. It's the same kind of thing. It's if you keep doing well, you could play forever, but you don't win the game. You never win SimCity. Do you, I'm pretty sure you don't win Football Manager. Do you? Hey, you win a. Uh... You win. You can win the league, or you can win the. Yeah, team. and then you then you go and do next year's league and try and win that, don't you? Pretty much, yeah. Football football doesn't end and say that's it. Somebody has won football. I, no I, more I, no <laughs> more games of football because you have won football. If only. <laughs> I am. I imagine that there is a there is a loophole in Football Manager that go, that plays the we are the champions. You lift up the trophy and it's done. 
That's it. End credits roll. You've finished Football Manager. It takes a photo of you and uh, puts you on the on the Hall of Fame. Right. <laughs> no, the way football works is you win it and then it's like, okay, can you next do that year. again? Or someone else is going to take the trophy off you next year. But it's my trophy. Not anymore. Someone else wants it. Arsenal wants it back. Fuck you, Arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, am I allowed to swear in this anymore? Yes, you are. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> How are we up to episode 28 and you don't realise what our language policy is? I, I thought we had two separate ones because we were on two different channels. But <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> I, I, just put, I, I, was. I just put a strong language tag on the video and assume that's good enough for most people. If you don't want to hear people swear, don't watch the podcast when it says strong language at the top of it. Okay, right. Uh, so it's that kind of podcast. It's that kind of podcast, yes. Well, in that case, <laughs> I, I don't. I don't. I don't want two hours of continuous expletives. But you know, if one slips out, that's fine. If one slips out, that's fine, and hopefully, people will not take too much offence at it. That's that is our official policy laid out in not writing there. So, Will Hawken. <laughs> yeah, Will. It's it's good. <laughs> that that that's that box quote there. Yeah, is it? it's good. Okay, it's good. All right, cool. Well, we'll it's, see how good really, it is under reloaded games, I suppose. It's okay, really, well, it's really well balanced, and like I say, it's still got a very good player base. So I haven't had to wait for any matches, and it's good fun. Fair enough. Well, that's what you want in a multiplayer game, I guess. A fairly important one, or two things. Cool. All right. I, if I can dip into something I've been doing, since you guys seem to not be going anywhere. Uh, GTA <laughs> so 5. Nothing ever changes. Yeah. GTA 5. I've been playing that. Have you already? Actually, I meant to touch on this last week, but there's so much on packs, I never did get around to it. Uh, heists. Heists are at long last, actually, in GTA 5, so I've been playing some of those. Have you uh, been getting on in your heist career? Uh, not very well. Oh, dear. Because the game is broken as all hell. It does okay. not work well. Speaking of games which need an update, you know. It all uh, comes back together. Yes. Uh, so, uh, well, we finished one and a half of the heists. I think we'd, uh, we've, done, we've done the first heist, which is just like, go have a look at the bank. Go and steal an <laughs> armoured car. Take the armoured car to the bank and rob the bank. Ta-da, you have money. I would have it's just liked. I would have just liked the thought of you just the heist being look at the bank and just walking <laughs> away. You got a trophy for it. Well, it, the the heist mission setup is basically they've done it much like they've done, if you played through the campaign. There's a there's a bunch of heists throughout the campaign which involve some setup stuff. It's uh, you go and steal various cars and bits of equipment that you'll need to pull off a specific heist, and there'll be two, three, four bits of that that you need to do, and then you'll pull off the big heist and you'll use all the equipment that you've compiled and. So far in multiplayer, all the missions have just been fairly standard things like, oh, so and so wants you to go kill and do kill a dude, go kill the dude and come back, or oh, go kill a bunch of people and steal this valuable briefcase from them, or whatever, you know, standard GTA, go steal things and kill things, and that's it. Once it's done, it's done. Mission over. So the heist and this sort of tie together a bit of a narrative arc. There's like there will be two to four setup bits and then the big heist but yeah like i said the first one is just kind of weak source the first part of the mission uh, literally doesn't involve shooting a single bullet it's literally drive down the motorway for a bit or the freeway or highway or whatever it is they don't have motorways uh drive down the motorway a bit till you get to the bank uh park outside the bank for a bit uh whilst your 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 character who's telling you about the mission rambles on for a while then he's like all right go home now and you go home that's literally the first part of the first mission. It's like, okay. So, and this is a two-person mission, by the way. One person gets to drive the car. Yeah. And the other person just sits The other there. person is sat in the passenger seat for like 10 minutes whilst you drive down the friggin' motorway. Can he, so, uh, is, can he change the radio station? No, the driver gets to change the radio station. <laughs> <laughs> passenger is not allowed to touch the radio. The GTA is just really giving player two permission to go have a cigarette or something. <laughs> well, if you, yeah, pretty much. 
you, you can you can use your taunt, whichever whatever you've got that set to in the car. You can sit there and one of them's like have a bit of a dance. You can have a dance in the chair. Oh wow! Or you could, <laughs> they could technically fire guns out the window if they wanted. That would probably attract the police, and then you'd end up having to escape them. Um, well, so it wouldn't be very advisable. But if you're but if your only other option is to just sit there and dance, then uh, I well, the other really option blame. is that if you attack out of the window whilst your weapon is set to unarmed, you basically just flip the bird out the window so it passes by, <laughs> which is quite amusing in its own right. Dance or flip people off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Those are your options. So yeah, the second part of the mission is at least at least that involves stealing an armored car, so that's slightly more interesting. And then you just go to the bank and. Uh, yeah, there's a, again, I kind of, the, when we played through, we gave, we gave the other guy the less interesting part of the mission. So when it came to actually doing the heist, we're like, okay, we're going to break into the bank and steal the stuff. You can drive the car. <laughs> so at least he got to drive the car this time, but driving the car was the boring bit of the game that time. So, yeah. I think he got to hold off the police outside whilst we were sort of fighting the police. Uh, and there was a couple of mini games which I had not seen before in GTA, so that was kind of interesting. So there's one hacking mini game that, whilst your driver is driving you there, you have to sit and do this on your mobile phone or whatever. You bring up this little hacking app, which yeah. is not a million miles from playing Snake, basically. So you play three rounds of Snake, uh, getting progressively harder. And then it's like, congratulations, you've hacked into the bank by playing Snake. So, yeah. Uh, and then there's a drill into the vault minigame where you have to use the drill at the right speed. And if you use the drill at the wrong speed, it will overheat and stop. And you don't drill into the bank. I didn't like that one. That one was really frustrating to get it exactly right. I was just like, my, my drill just kept jamming again and again and again. It's like, God damn it, I cannot get into this bank. What the hell? It's just, <laughs> uh, stop. <laughs> stop. And it's like, this is why I don't do DIY, damn it. <laughs> I am not a DIY person. So, yeah, that's at least slightly different gameplay, I suppose, but nothing terribly exciting. And then we've done all of the setup for the second heist, but not managed to get a group together to actually pull off the heist itself. So, uh, the, the main issue with it is just actually getting a group, because, quite frankly, for the amount of time we've been playing the game this week, we should have actually technically finished probably most of the heists by now, but the sheer amount of times you try to set up a game and it just straight up fails is just ridiculous. Um, and GTA is just loading screen simulator, basically. It's the amount of times it's just, uh, it's crazy. You load the game to get into the game first time. If you're trying to join somebody through Xbox Live, it will load single player before it will say, oh, do you want to join this person in multiplayer? Then it will load multiplayer for you. Uh, then if you want to lo launch the mission, it will take you, it will load while it takes you to your house. And then once you're in your house, you can launch the mission and load that interface. And then everybody else has to load into your game. And then you have to load the cutscene to start the bit of the heist. And then you have to load the actual mission setup bit, and then you have to load the mission itself. Uh, so a lot of loading screens involved, and if anybody fails at any point of the t in the game to connect to anybody else, uh, which is quite frequent, uh, everything just falls apart and it's like, oh, never mind, try again, let's just send you back to your house. So you're saying that it's not the smoothest operation in the world? It's not a, it's not a particularly slick process to getting into a game in GTA, no. It's really not. It's it needs a little bit of work, or like a lot of work. And an argument I keep getting is that oh, but it's free. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. Free isn't really an excuse for it not to work. Yeah, that's a, you can't you can't just say oh, it doesn't matter that shit because it's free. But I don't know. I suppose the I suppose the rebuttal to that is just don't play the bloody thing, but. If it's shit, don't play it. But when it works, it's it's reasonably entertaining. There is some there is some cool, slightly different stuff in there. It's an interesting way to play the game. But it's just so frustrating trying to actually get anything to happen. It's ridiculous, especially with randomers. If you try and play with random players, that's never going to happen. The only games we've actually managed to get coordinated and organised is literally through the GTA subreddit. It was just like, hi guys, we're looking for a crew of three other people to actually do some heists this evening. Does anybody want in? And you get people like, oh yeah, here's my gamer tag, and you get four people, and it's like, okay, we're going to work on some heists together. That's the only way we've ever been able to make it happen. 
just trying to get just using the matchmaking just doesn't work and when it does work it's usually some 12 year old who's the worst person in the world so just he, the wor- he's, the, he's the guy flipping everyone off no the i i say he's he's the we had one group that we did get into a mission we actually got the mission started and it genuinely actually we were actually playing the game we actually got to the point where we're playing the game and we've got this squeaky voiced kid over microphone saying okay you guys don't do anything at all i'm going to do everything you guys just stay behind me and don't die because i know how to do this mission so you guys don't need to play the game i'm going to play the game for you and i was like well, I'm so glad we bought the game for this. I'm so glad I bought the game so that I don't have to play the game because, geez, if this 12-year-old here wasn't to stay here to save me having to play the game, I don't know what I'd be doing. Jeez, I well, might have to play the game. You have to, you have to, you just get to sit back, crack open a beer, and watch that 12-year-old school you on how it's done. Yeah, I know. I, I, I don't know about you, but I'm very grateful that 12-year-old was there to tell us exactly how to do that mission. How well did it work out for him? I don't mind telling you that we committed suicide several times on purpose just to annoy the kid. Because <laughs> <laughs> it instantly fails the mission if anyone dies, so it's like, Oh, I seem to have fallen out of the helicopter without a parachute. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I've drunk this beaker of acid. That's yep. not an option in GTA, but I'd probably have given it a go if we could. Sorry, I'm just imagining that's how the banks of acid. Sorry. Well, that, the, that particular one was supposed to be stealing, I don't know, something from a luxury yacht offshore. So it was like, take the helicopter to the yacht. And it was like, oh, no, I have fallen out of it. Oh, the water's coming towards me very hard. Poof, dead. Oh, no, I've fallen off the yacht. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm getting shot at in the water by people from the yacht. Oh, they seem to have shot me. Oh, I seem to have died. Mission failed. All right, guys, do you want to try that one again? <laughs> oh, no, I've eaten too much shrimp from the buffet. <laughs> <laughs> uh so, yeah, that was fun, winding up annoying 12-year-olds by dying repeatedly. I don't think we ever did finish that mission. <laughs> so that's, uh, that, I don't know, that has potential. But it's one of those ones where it's like, give it a few weeks for A, the system to settle down. Because on launch day, it was unplayable entirely. We didn't get a single game. It was just failing all evening. Presumably just from the sheer number of people trying to actually play the heist, because... God knows this has been built up and hyped up long enough on GTA Online. It was like, oh, this is coming soon, coming soon, heist, it's going to be amazing, it's going to be the biggest thing ever, it's going to be uh, the best GTA experience ever, it's going to be fantastic, and it's taken them like a year and a half to actually bring it out. And now that it's here, everybody's playing it, and suddenly it's unplayable because everybody's playing it. So, yeah, give it a couple weeks to actually settle down, um, and then also for, hopefully for Rockstar to patch uh, patch and update their netcode and stuff so that people actually can stay together reasonably easy although one would hope they'd have been doing that in the last year and a half but hey uh, and slightly off topic because you said uh, rockstar what do you make of um the return of rockmand that's <laughs> that's um okay that's that's not even the same company but hey <laughs> I, I guess you're just going for the sort of wordplay you said rockstar I they both begin with rock, so... <laughs> yeah, okay. I see. Um, sorry, sorry. I don't know. Off top, topic that no, much. fair enough. No, it's fine. I was rambling on about GTA long enough anyway. Uh, rock Band, I don't know what they're going to do with Rock Band 4. I genuinely don't. They had they had that at PAX, and I never went and checked it out, to be quite honest. Um, I don't know what they're planning to do with it that could be any different to what they already did with GTA 3. I think all I can, all I can speculate on is that it's Rock Band for the next-gen consoles. Because, to the best of my knowledge, Rock Band 3 doesn't work on the Bone and PS4, does it? They haven't done a version for it that I'm aware of. No, I'm not that I'm aware of. So, all I can presume, it's literally people are like, Oh man, wouldn't it be great if we could play Rock Band on the Xbox One? And I'm like, oh, well, now you can. Ta-da! I'm presuming that's pretty much the bulk of what it is. It's just there isn't an option to play those games on the new consoles. So they've decided to make an option to play those games on the new consoles. And there's probably not a lot more to it than that. As always, my concern, I'm, especially with the generation change, moving to another console, is like, the DLC, would the DLC work? Because they released a lot of DLC for Rock Band 3. Hope so. You'd hope so. To move to Rock Band 4 and they'd be like, oh, no, no, these songs don't work. That would be kind of a kicker. That would be a hell of a kicker. That would be a very much a non-selling point for a lot of people, I suspect. 
Because the kind of people who are really into Rock Band that they're still engaged with it at this point probably are engaged with it to the point that they bought a lot of DLC. Like, you know, the console we use for Button Mash, which has thousands and thousands of tracks on it because the, the, the generous chap who provides it for us is really, really, really into Rock Band. And we are very, very grateful. We are very grateful, but yeah, I was going to say, I just don't want to see bad business practices ruin ruin games for folks like him. But, uh, I don't know. Like I say, I say unless, it's you, unless you're literally the kind of person who's dying to play it on the Xbox One, I'm not sure what else it's got going for it. I mean, I don't know enough about it. Do, do you know much about Rock Band 4? I'm not at the moment. I just found it interesting when it was announced it's going back because it's been dead for a couple of years, hasn't it? It, they haven't done a lot. They recently did some DLC for Rock Band 3, which was kind of made the news simply because it was actually DLC for Rock Band 3, which everyone had sort of assumed they'd stopped doing. Um, but uh, given that I'm not up on the news for Rock Band 4, I was kind of hoping, given that you'd brought the topic up, you might actually know something about it. Afraid not. <laughs> Although Googling it... Um, yeah, I was gonna say if you Google it, the most news that anyone seems to have on it is it will be out in 2015. It will be out on PS4 and Xbox One, confirming what I was just saying. It will be 1080p and run at 60 frames per second. Because I don't know. I guess dots moving across the screen needed to be done in 1080p, 60 frames per second. How else would you view them? Given that it's not exactly <laughs> like Far Cry, I'd prefer it in 4K if we're honest. <laughs> at 120 frames per second but it's, it's, it's almost the kind of game where the quality of what you're looking at really doesn't make much difference to the game itself you can make it more visually lovely if you want but when it comes down to it 90% of what you're focusing on most of the time is just the dots on the screen you the 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 rock stars in the background could be crafted in the highest fidelity they could be photorealistic you're not looking at them you're looking at the dots so that you know whether you're playing the song right. I'm playing this game all wrong. All kinds of wrong. <laughs> oh, you, you you were basically hitting the notes in time to the, <laughs> the guitarist banging his head in the background. Clearly. Uh, that, would okay. that would explain why I've never got a particularly great score on it. <laughs> that might be it. That'd do it. Well, you're learned now. You can you can be professional when it comes to Rock Band 4. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be challenging for walls in the Rock Band room. Right. So, well, I think for us to do that, we would need to own a Xbox One or PlayStation 4. I don't think Button Mash as a whole does yet, do we? Nope, we're not there yet. I guess some of the guys have the consoles, but I don't think they're quite willing to sort of put it up into the public arena where, where you know... It's not the... that we don't trust our fans, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just that there are, when there are a lot of people coming into a building, yeah... Accidents can happen and things, and you wouldn't want an accident to happen to such an expensive piece of equipment. But we're working on it. We're working on idiot-proofing all the things in the building. We'll eventually make Button Mash into a padded cell. It's going to become a life-size Takeshi's Castle. That's the long-term. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's, that's your long-term plan, I think. Yep. Uh, all the crystal maze. It's going to be a combination of the two. Uh, my, uh, my preference is for the latter, to be honest. With Richard O'Brien behind the bar. I haven't yeah, because I've never consumed enough Takeshi's Castle in my life to be such a big fan of it, whereas uh, Crystal Maze is a classic. I'm hearing no dissent from that, so <laughs> I'm going to assume you're all on board. Okay, nodding, Crystal Maze next stop. Okay. What else have you played apart from uh, GTA this week, then, John? Uh, I have revisited a bunch of stuff I played at PAX for the YouTube channel because uh, people sent me demos of things. I played Valhalla, which is exactly the same as the one I played at PAX and talked about it last week. Um, Gain Mini Metro, no, no, uh, Rive, sorry, Rive, uh, they sent me the same build and I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. I hadn't expected him to send me it. They were just like, here's a press thing for people who want to be in the press. And I don't think it was related to me talking to them at PAX. It just kind of came out of the blue. And they were like, oh, you're on our press list somehow. Here, have a copy of our game. I was like, all right, I will play your game because your game was kind of cool. That works for me. Yeah, that's fine. So nothing new there, but I played it. Uh, Mini Metro, I did a... a I believe I mentioned I had managed to acquire that last week. Um, I played that. That's really quite compelling. It's still an early access thing. Although, again, it's one of those early access ones that you wouldn't know it wasn't finished, to be quite honest. 
Uh, I went into it playing it thinking it was a finished product, and there's very little about it that, short of just making more content for it, I don't know what they're doing with it, to be honest. It's uh, it's just a really simple game. I think it's intended to be on tablets. Just you, you start out with a rough kind of map of a city, and there are a few shapes on it. And if you draw lines between the shapes, it creates a subway line or underground or whatever, you mass transit system of some sort. And it takes people from the dots. So someone, a square, like a person represented by a square icon will appear at one of the stations. They're like, I wish to go to the triangle station. And you must convey them there. And then gradually it just adds more stations and more people and more stations and more people and more stations and more people. And you need to keep up with demand. And if too many people have stood waiting at one station for too long, it's like, oh, this, this station has overcrowding and you failed the game. It's surprisingly good. <laughs> You start out with it three sounds sub- like a simulator. Uh, it's way too simple to be a simulator. Simulator <laughs> usually is... I was going to say, your simulator is usually like the actual driving a vehicle around. I mean, like an actual subway simulator. You'd be like, oh, I'm the person who drives the subway car. This is literally just... This is closer to a city builder than anything else. You think about something like SimCity or City Skylines or whatever. It's like, I'm going to plan the subway system. And you're like, I'll draw a line between here and here. And people can get from here to here. And they want to go from here to here. So I'll plan this out and move this around. It's more of a city builder kind of thing, mentality kind of thing. And you start out with three subway lines. And every week they give you more resources. They were like, oh, you can... Every week it gives you one more train to put on the lines. And then it usually gives you a choice of two perks. Sometimes the perk is you can have another line. Uh, You might be able to have more tunnels. For tunnels are a resource that you need to be able to get across bodies of water. So if a station pops up on some isolated island, which it always bloody does, uh, you have to connect a train line across the water to them. And if you want to connect them on to anywhere else, that means for one bloody station you've got two two tunnels needed. So maybe it would be worth trying to make those into terminals, but I don't know. I'm kind of learning the ins and outs of it. Sounds a little bit like a... I can't remember the name of it on the top of my head, but there was a German board game which was very similar. Which you had to connect up routes. Are uh, you thinking of Ticket to Ride? Is it? Is that a German one? Seems like it would be. There's Ticket to Ride. There's Carcassonne. Not Carcassonne. Carcassonne involves making roads. Ticket to Ride is certainly about building train lines. It might be Ticket to Ride. I don't. I don't know. I can't say I know a lot about Ticket to Ride. It's only one of those fairly successful non-traditional board games. It's, you know, it's not Monopoly. Yeah. It's nothing else. I don't know who made it or where it originally came from. I think it was like German Game of the Year for about five years in a row. It could well be. It's Like I say, it's a very popular one. It's it's like, it's with your Catan and Carcassonne kind of one of your big popular classic board games, as it were. Um, yeah, I'm it is... Uh, I'm glad you're uh, getting enjoyment out of Mini Metro. Uh, it, it did surprise me. I didn't. I, I don't know quite what I expected because I think we covered this a while back on the new releases. I think we bombed past it one day. I was like, "Oh, Mini Metro! This is something about building a subway. It doesn't look very interesting. Let's move on." And I'm then sure now I've mock- played it. I'm like, "Oh, it's actually kind of good." So you're apologising to Mini Metro for mocking it. We didn't mock it. We probably just didn't give it as much attention as it deserved. I apologise. Yes, but the fact is, when we're when we're literally looking and making assessments based on the name, the description, the screenshots, and the trailer, which is what we do during our new releases, if your game doesn't look very good, we're going to say it doesn't look very good, and quite frankly, that is the point at which you're trying to sell someone a product. Your storefront is how you're supposed to be trying to sell a product to a person. If your game doesn't look very good on the storefront, people aren't going to buy it. It it might be a fantastic game, but if it doesn't look good, chances are people are going to skip over it, and on that particular occasion, really, did. I'm really, really sad in this moment that we have not queued up the... uh... The more you know sound of it. Uh, yeah, I guess. Where exactly were you wanting to insert that? Just after the bit where you said, uh, if your game doesn't look very good, people won't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> that was so okay. blindingly obvious. So <laughs> it deserved a... Doo, doo, doo. I don't know. I mean, it's, it should be obvious, but not necessarily, I think. Yes. I think some of the some of the names on credited on for some reason I've been using Board Game Geek a lot this show. Uh, some of the names credited on Board Game Geek make, make Ticket to Ride look like it was French. Not French, as far as I'm aware. The artist was Cyril Dogin. He does sound pretty damn French. <laughs> I think my, I think my pronouncing it with the French accent probably makes it sound more French <laughs> than it is. 
But he's actually just an Austrian going, Oh no, you're so... <laughs> he's like... worked on he's worked on other French titles, so I think he may be French. Oh, okay. I right. don't know. I don't know, I don't know. Shall we swiftly move on? Oh, hang on. Oh, Wikipedia page says it's a German style board game. Oh, there you go. So there you go. That's good. So that's that. Yes, trains. Lots of trains. Uh, I played a I played a obnoxious amount of Black Ice as well, uh, which was another thing I picked up at PAX and I played a little bit for my YouTube channel. Uh, and I say that as though this we're not putting this podcast out on the same YouTube channel anymore. I'm still in that <laughs> <way of> thinking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, denied. Would you like to encourage some audience participation instead? I won't go boo, John. <laughs> Tell us what you think about the move to the new channel in the comments below. <laughs> Do you miss my segues? Let me know. Yes. We should, we should have some polls. <laughs> did, did you enjoy Michael's uh, segues? Yes or no? Vote now. Uh, so, yeah, in Black Ice, kind of first-person cyberpunk hacking thing, it had been sold to me by... Um, Joe Mirabello from Tower of Guns, he was like, oh yeah, it's a roguelike thing. And in my video, I was like, oh yeah, it's a roguelike thing, because he told me it was. Um, and the PAX thing didn't give me any evidence to suggest that it wasn't, because it was like, oh, you've died, thanks for playing next person. So I was like, oh, once you die, you die. And I, was, I just figured, you know, next player's next up. And there is kind of a roguelike mode. There is a hardcore permadeath kind of thing that you can toggle on, but most of the time, if you die, it's just like, oh, oh well, never mind, try again. <laughs> okay, you've died, so what? Go, go kill it again. Uh, unless you turn on hardcore permadeath things, so you can make it roguelike if you want. But, uh, yeah, other, other than that, it's just... Uh, I don't know, it's good, but it's... You're expecting very more. Very grindy Skinner box, kind of. It's, it's, I'm playing loads and loads and loads of it, but I'm like, uh, after a while, I'm just like... I'm doing a lot of the same thing over and over again, and I'm not sure to what end. I'm getting b bigger and better guns, and the better guns are more fun because they're better, and I'm getting new toys to play with, and this is exciting and interesting, and oh look, a jetpack upgrade, ooh! Uh, but at the end of the day, it's like, this is simply just numbers get bigger, and I'm just going and killing more enemies for numbers get bigger. And eventually I killed the final boss thing, and it was like, great, you killed the final boss thing, congratulations, a winner is you. And, by the way, the final boss drops really shitty loot, <laughs> I will say. I was like, oh my god, this whatever this drops is going to be the best thing ever, this is going to be so good. Nope. It just dropped, like, some level 5 shit. I'm, like, level 120 at this point. Like, it just dropped the Pez dispenser. Basically, yeah, I'm like level 120 and just dropped like some level 5 weapon with like 20 DPS on it. And I'm like do using weapons with like 750 DPS on it. I was like, well, that's going to the shop to be sold for pennies. <laughs> it's like, this is not good to me at this point. I expected the final boss to drop something a little bit better. The loot maybe could use some tweaking, yeah, because you're doing mid-range stuff. It's still, some of the stuff is just like toys for noobs and other times it's like, oh, this is actually quite good. And then I kind of got to the point where some some of the some of the things you're attacking because you're moving around this cyberpunk sort of virtual world and attacking servers and some of the servers are shops and if you attack and destroy a shop, shops are really really powerful and really hard to destroy. But once you've got to the point where you can kill them, they drop a lot of good loot. Uh, so I'm sort of got to the point where I'm like, ah, I can hack into these and destroy them and just get a massive ton of loot. Now I just take it to another shop, sell all the loot, and then go and destroy that shop for more loot. And there's kind of, that's kind of going to a bit of a cycle. I just go to the shop, I was like, I'll sell all the loot from the last shop, use this shop to browse their stuff, because the shops actually shit that sell the best equipment, I'll buy anything good from this shop using the loot from the last shop, and then I'm going to destroy you and take all your loot and repeat the process by going to the next shop. Well, well roguelike's got a good shopkeepers. Well, they're, they're servers, it's all computers, I'm not really attacking any shopkeepers, this is well, just computer like systems, it's fine. Like in Necromancer, where you kill the shopkeeper and his ghost haunts you. Oh god, yeah, that was terrifying. That's, that's that's not really that's not really there to encourage you to kill the shopkeeper, if we're honest. That's very much there to dissuade you when the ghost of the shopkeeper comes back to try and have revenge on you for killing him. That's not really going Which to encourage enough. you to kill the it's yeah, it's not encouraging you to kill the shopkeeper in that instance. So and Black Ice though, it kind of does because like 
it's the best loot in the game, so... Actually, no, I tell a lie, there is there is a giant shark robot thing that flies around the final boss server that when you kill it, it invariably drops a level 140 item, regardless of what level you are. So if you manage to kill it at level 90 or whatever, it drops a level 140 item. And it's like, ha, ha, you can't equip this for 50 levels. It's like, <laughs> so I've got a bunch of, I've killed that a few times now. I'm like, I've got a bunch of level 140 stuff. I still can't use it because I'm still level 120. So I still can't equip it. I did find out after I finished it that then when you go into the options to play the game, there is a artificially inflate the difficulty bit slider, which is like, just add 100 to the diff level difficulty of all the things in the game. So the final boss server is level 150, but it's like, oh, well, if you slide it up by 100, suddenly the final boss is level 250, and the shark is level... I guess it'll drop level 240 stuff, I guess? And the shops are going to be, like, difficulty 220-ish? And yeah, it's just artificially makes the game harder. And it's like, at that point, I was kind of like, I think I'm done. I can basically play through this game because I think the hardest difficulty, it's like I said, the final boss is 150, and the hardest difficulty you can make it is 650. So there's like 500 levels of artificial difficulty to play through if you want. But at this point, it's literally just killing things over and over and over and over again until the numbers reach 650. And I'm just like, you know what? I think I'm done. I don't think I want to keep playing until the numbers reach 650. That's just too much. That's too far. And there's not enough going on in the meantime to keep that interesting. I mean, for a little while, it's kind of a cool game, but you can't just keep doing the same thing for 650 levels, because that's not fun. Yeah, it loses its appeal um, about level 300, I would imagine. I'll be honest, at level 120, I'm done. I don't think I need to go to 300. And level 120, it's one of those it's one of those weird games where I'm just like, I'm not even sure I'm having fun at this point, but I'm close enough to finishing it that I think I can finish it, so I'm going to finish it. I did that with 10 million as well, which I that one, the longevity of 10 million was not enough to keep me going for as long as it did. But it was one of those games where it was like, look, I'm so close to getting 10 million points that it looks seriously a couple more runs and I'll have 10 million and then I'll be done. I can say I've finished this game and that's it. I'm, I'm out. But and then it's like, oh, three hours later, I'm nearly at 10 million, guys. <laughs> the game just keeps dragging you back in. Yeah, same with this. It's like, oh, I got to like level 150 and I was like, oh, I bet I can take down the final boss. I'll t I bet I can do that. Yeah, okay. Sure, I'll, I'll try and take on the final boss. Ooh, okay, that's kind of difficult. I'll, I'll get some better gear. I'll just go kill a few more shops. So I'll kill the shops, sell the loot, buy equipment, kill the shop, sell the loot, buy equipment. I was like, okay, now I'm level 120 and I've got some slightly better equipment. I've upgraded a bunch of the stuff that hadn't been upgraded yet. Some of the stuff's a bit better. I've got a bit more DPS. I was like, now I'll take on the final server. It's like, oh, and then a few hours later, yeah. I actually have finished the bloody thing. And the final boss still took me like five attempts. But it was one of those ones where it's like, I'm close enough that I reckon I can do this. And I still did cheese it a bit. I just, the, the AI pathfinding on the enemies is okay, but not great. They can, if you stand on top of a building, they can find their way up to you, but not well. So you can mostly, for the most part, sit on top of a building and just shoot them. If you have any sort of AI companions, uh, bots to you summon them and they fight alongside you and ally kind of things, uh, they basically, they genuinely seem to tank stuff. So if you summon any of those, they take all the aggro on all the enemies and they're just, yeah, they, they pick up all the enemies on the floor and you just shoot down at them. It's like, there's a lot of times I'll be like, okay, I can do this level by cheesing it. Especially with the shops. The first time I killed the shop is like, okay, I totally cheesed that shop. I want to get to a state where I can actually kill a shop legitimately, like staying on the floor and actually fighting the things, rather than cheating by sitting on the roof and shooting them. And eventually I did get to a point where I could actually genuinely beat the shops. I did not get to that stage with the final boss, but again, at this point, I really can't be bothered. <laughs> I'm okay with not beating the final boss. Wow. There was an achievement for landing on the roof of the final boss server, which is massive, and I had like a level 50 power jetpack, which was, I think, the best I was going to get for the first playthrough, and it didn't land me on the roof, not quite, I nearly got there, and I was like, you know what, nuts this, but a little, a little bit of me is now going, well, if I went through the next level of difficulty, I could probably get like a level 60 jetpack, that would probably do it, if I could get a level 60 jetpack, I could get up there. 
Boss no, John no. forever. Although, oh, I'll tell you what I've just realised. Oh no, he's ha- having a eureka moment on the podcast. I am. Uh, the way the equipment in the game works is you get five equipment slots on one through five. You can assign a button to space, shift, um, and the two mouse buttons. And I just I just put my jetpack on space. It was like, fine, I don't need a jump. Because you can unequip your jump and just put something else there. You could put a weapon there if you wanted. The... Actually, the equipment's actually really kind of cool in that game. Uh, so I put my jetpack on that. But the thought occurs, you could just wear more jetpacks. <laughs> just have Maybe. big jetpacks on your back. Maybe. No, I, actually, no. I tell a lie, that probably wouldn't work. Because you, you, they, they would use a communal pool of energy. So if you burnt out of energy. What I'm thinking, though, is the jetpacks, as you use them, they overheat and they use more energy. So if you were to sort of mix up jetpacks, if you had, like five jetpacks and you just did 20% burn on each jetpack they would all burn cool and lift you higher maybe or I could just get a better jetpack or I could stop playing the bloody game (laughs) Yeah, for a man that's uh, not quite sure if he's having fun with the game you do seem very committed to it I'm committed to Chiefs damn it I'm not committed to the game I need the achievements yeah I have done fifty percent, fifty-seven percent of the achievements in the game. Although some of them are, like, say, like killer level five hundred server, and it's like, you know what? No, <laughs> because the amount of time I'll have to play to get to that stage, I can't be bothered. No, I don't think I'm going to do that. I think this is the kind of thing you're going to tell us that you're going to quit every week, but you'll just keep. I'll come back and be like, guys, I'm up, I'm going, I'm up to level three hundred and fifty in Black Eyes, guys. <laughs> I have a level. I'm nearly there, guys. I have a level seventy jetpack now. <laughs> I'm so close to getting on the roof. I can nearly get onto the roof, guys. Then at the, end, and at the end of it, you'll be like, you know what, I'm not having fun. I'm going to quit this. And we'll be like, sure you will, John. Sure you will. I got a level 72 jetpack next week. Uh, yeah. Also play Deadbolt. Deadbolt is an in-development title from the guy who made Risk of Rain. Which is actually really cool. And it looks a lot like Risk of Rain. I guess the guy has one style, and it's Risk of Rain. <laughs> because he's a pixel artist, but... Yeah, uh, if it works. <laughs> it, 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 the concept is kind of strange. It's... You are essentially death in service to a fireplace. Or rather, the fire in the fireplace. And the fire speaks to you. So it's uh, the fire from Howl's Moving Castle, then? Yes, yes, actually. Prob- if the if that fire was a little bit more malevolent, I think. I think that fire was generally a fairly benevolent spirit, was it not? Yeah, I think he was. He was cool. It's more more whimsical, I think. But yeah, in this, uh, the fire talks to you and is like, "Oh, I, I, I am the keeper of life force, and everybody has a little bit of fire within them. That is the life spirit. And some people try to steal that fire from me. People who take their lives through drug overdoses or suicide or whatever. Those, those people are snatched too soon, and they take the fire with them. And I don't um, normally I loan the fire to people. When they die, the fire returns to me. But these people, they keep the fire, and I need that fire back. So you go out and." You you have to go kill zombies for some reason because the zombies are basically the people who kept the fire and by killing zombies and burning their drug stashes the drugs being ash <laughs> then you yeah i don't know it's kind of strange so you it's it's uh it's a 2d kind of puzzle thing it it requires you navigating various sort of apartment complex kind of things or sort of run down slum kind of areas uh, you go in, you start out with just a knife, but you quickly pick up a bunch of guns and you can just shoot the, shoot the zombies in the head to kill them. Uh, in spite of it being a 2D thing, it's got accuracy, which is kind of weird. So if you shoot a zombie at close range, you, it's pretty much going to be a, you're going to fire where you want. Uh, but as you move the mouse further away from your character, the aiming reticle expands and it's like, oh, your shot could go anywhere in this circle. So if you're trying to take out a zombie from range, you're going to have to fire a few shots. And it gives you limited ammunition in each level, so you kind of need to figure out what the optimal path of doing it is. Uh, because you are deaf, I guess, you have the ability to tra- travel through various vents in the building. There's usually like a little steam vent outside or some kind of vent in the ground that you can go into to sneak your way into the building without going through the front door. On the second level, that literally allows you to pop up through the toilet whilst a zombie is sitting on it, causing the zombie to explode, which is quite amusing. <laughs> it does sound like a wonderful image. Yeah. 
Uh, so you enter through the toilets and they infiltrate the building from the bathrooms. Uh, you can you can activate the light switches in each room so the zombies can't see into the room too well if the lights are out, which they're not terribly smart. So if you flip the, if you flick the lights out and then open the door, uh, the zombies won't be able to see you in the doorway too well. If you stood right in the doorway, they'll be able to see you. But if you stand back from the door a bit, they'll just they'll probably just won't notice anything. But the AI is surprisingly good. I mean, if you if you make noises, if you fire guns, you can or even just wandering around a bit too much, sometimes they'll be like, oh, what's that noise? And they'll go investigate. It still needs some work, because quite a lot of time they'll just go to investigate, and then they'll just stand where they'd move to investigate. So, uh, so it, it's, it's kind of interesting. As I say, it's more mostly a puzzle kind of thing, but it does require a lot of reflexes and, you know, doing things right. It's a very Hotline Miami in that respect, actually. I think the one advantage I would say Hotline Miami, Miami has over it is that Hotline Miami knows you're going to fail a lot and it's really quick to restart when you fail. It's one of those ones that's like, oh, I'm dead, oh, I'm playing again, oh, I'm dead, I'm playing again, oh, I'm dead, I'm playing again. This one, it's really challenging to get it right and then it's, it does like a few seconds while it's like, okay, now you're going to start the mission again. Okay, go. That's, because you're dying fairly frequently, it would be nice if that got going again a bit faster, if there was less downtime between runs. But otherwise, it's actually quite a cool concept so far. It's, I think, uh, from what I've seen of Hotline Miami 2, it's maybe closer to Hotline Miami 2 than 1. 1 was just about murdering people. 2, apparently there are stuff where you need to, like, conserve ammunition and use it and make sure you're using the right ammunition on the right people at the right time. And there's elements of that here. It's like, oh, well, you've got the revolver. The revolver is a good one-hit one, one hit kill if you're up fairly close to someone. If you can actually land a headshot with that one, it's just Boom, zombie dead. If you've got a shotgun and there's a couple of zombies close to each other, you can use a zombie a shotgun to take out like two zombies at once. But the shotguns are usually held by a really tough zombie that's going to take like three revolver kills to get in the first place. So, you got to figure out how to do things in the right order. Hmm. It's kind of cool. I like it. That's Dead Bolt, yeah. And Sky Saga. I've been playing Sky Saga. Um, Oops. <laughs> have you got your battle axe yet? I got a battle axe, but it dropped as loot. I didn't make it. Oh, wow. That's pretty good loot. Yeah, it's an iron one, though, so I'm kind of uh, like, oh, I got a battle axe, but it's crap. Well, you weren't exactly going to find a, a rose iron one. <laughs> well, no. Um, that's I did I did lament recently in one of my videos that uh, it'd be nice if the high-level content actually dropped or had enemies even holding high-level equipment, because... Even in the Dark Worlds, the most I ever see any enemies actually really wearing is just gold. It's iron and occasionally a bit of gold if they're a bit tougher than other enemies. Or it's like, oh, I don't think the armor makes a dramatic amount of difference, so, you know, it'd be interesting to see a warlord coming at you wearing blue steel armor. It's like, oh, <laughs> shit, shit just got real. Yep. Now I've got a tough guy to fight. So, I don't know. But, hey, alpha, early stuff. They're probably going to have a lot more. Chances are, well, yeah, again, this is probably early content. It's probably the fact that these are only, like, the first two difficulties of worlds. They'll probably have, like, a... It'll be, like, red keystones with a desert world, and then there'll be dark desert worlds that probably will have really tough stuff in it later, to be fair. Yeah, absolutely. And I look forward to seeing these things. Hmm, me too. But uh, I think next... The next actual alpha build, when they actually probably update is and probably wipe the bloody characters as well, I suspect, uh, is going to be May. Why would they wipe my character? Because uh, they, I'm pretty sure they did after Alpha 2 before Alpha 3 started, so I think they would for 4 as well. It's uh, I don't know, maybe they will, maybe they won't, but... Um, it seems like one of those games where they're like, okay, new alpha, so everybody gets a blank slate. Nobody's competing on unfair <laughs> terms or anything. I wouldn't want the newbies in Alpha 4 to be going up against the guy who's running around dual-wielding blue steel swords in PvP or anything. Speaking of which, I actually finally made my PvP gear. Not that I actually started playing on Thursday evening before <laughs> PvP ended. I was like, oh, PvP! Oh, there's not much less time left to play PvP. Hey, PvP, I'd better go make a load of gear. And then by the time I'd finished making it, I was like, I think it, it, it had finished, so yeah. I couldn't do much. I have plenty plenty gear for it, it's just I don't really have the time on a Thursday evening. It's the only place in the game you can get redstone from, so I really wanted to go just to be that guy who just digs all the redstone out of the castle walls while <laughs> everyone else is trying to play. I was thinking that was a special item then, it's just cosmetic redstone isn't it 
It is. It's, it's just a <laughs> building block, but the only place you can find it is in the red base in PvP. Yeah. Which is kind of the worst place to put it, because then people are like, oh shit, I want to build my castle out of this. But the only way to do this is to be the guy who goes into PvP and doesn't play PvP. <laughs> You're the one guy who's digging holes in the walls so that you can keep it for later, whilst everyone else is actually trying to capture the flag. <laughs> although, I th although I think a lot of people kind of probably appreciate that fact. They're like, we know this is a rare item, and I think everybody probably wants at least some of it. So I think most people can probably appreciate the fact that you're tr you want the rare material. But yeah, so uh, business as usual. I've got slightly better gear in Sky Saga. That's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. I, built, I, built, I built a rose iron chest plate with um, the captain's chest plate with blue steel detailing it, and it just looks gold. Yes, it, all the versions look gold. Really? Yep. Yeah, I made all okay. of them, and they're all just gold. It's only in the captain's armor set. It's not nothing else. I got the captain's boots and hands, and they looked they didn't look quite so gold. I didn't think they looked especially gold. But the chest plate was just like, this just looks like gold with gold detailing. I was like, why did I yeah. bother putting these exotic materials in? No, I built both uh, rosé and, and blue steel, rather. Yeah. Exactly the same look. No, oh, fair enough. Okay. Hmm. Okay. I, I did kind of a little bit of me wants to kind of make multiple sets just to see what the art like just to just like the detailing to see if that makes any difference to the actual armor value of anything. That's kind of why I'm mostly intrigued by. It. It's like if I do a rosé and armor with blue steel detailing. What difference does that actually make to the armor value compared to rose iron with rose iron detailing? But as far as I can tell, rose iron is just more durable. They both have the same kind of damage absorption. But I, I what? Uh, it's more. Is it, I mean, I I picked it out based on a cosmetic thing. So what I want to know is, does it actually actually make an actual fundamental difference? If just you know, just like the the stylized pattern, the fancy lines woven around the front of the chest plate. If I use a different coloured material, is that, does that actually affect the practical purposes of the armour in any way, shape or form? Would the best gear simply be to make it pure rose steel? Or can I say, oh, you know what, there's a bit of fancy detailing on the front. I'd like that to be made of gold, just so that I look really fancy in combat. Or would that actually physically make the armour worse? It would take a very long time to test this. Yes, I know. That's why I, <laughs> that's why I can't be bothered. But yeah. I, want to, I, want to, I, would, I want to know. I do. Uh, so yeah. Oh well. I also I've also got a couple of he recipes for interesting and exotic helmets, so I might just start making them instead now. I think I've got all the helmets. I got four. I don't know how many there are. Got five. Okay, then I don't have all of them. <laughs> You're a helmet down. I am a helmet down. A little bit of me would like to have an easier way to sell items to other players rather than to add specific people on your friends list and have them visit your house to, you know, before they actually buy things. Because at this point it's like, oh, now I've actually got some recipes that other people probably would be interested in having. And I could, at this point, I feel like there would actually be a market for making rose iron and blue steel and indeed gold fancy helmets of other mm. kinds and then selling those to other players. Those are kind of those are kind of things that you would want to sell. Indeed, a battle axe, that's the kind of thing other players would want to buy. Because it's like, oh, this is actually kind of a hard-to-get recipe that requires a high-level stuff, and uh, it's a rare recipe and probably requires a high, high level. So most players aren't going to have that. And they'd be like, oh, I would like to buy a battle axe from this player. I would. I would, I would do that, except money has no real value in the game. Except for buying items from other players through the sale boxes. I already have all the items. Well, okay, no, but... Yeah, okay. I, I'm, I'm quite a big dick in this game, actually, because I go through the entire level mining out everything as quickly as possible to inhibit other players from getting items. Do you run into other players terribly often? Because obviously with the closed alpha stuff and the VIPs, I don't tend to run into many players. I, I uh, often play with large parties. Oh, right. I ran into a bunch of people on the Thursday because obviously it was like, oh uh, yeah, it's it's public day on Thursday. Everybody can play the game. Mm. It's like, but even then, even even in a public session, I couldn't find many people in the dark worlds. In the normal worlds, no. on a public day, I got groups. In dark worlds, I've never seen another player, and on any on any closed alpha day, I've never seen other players. Oh, if I, if I want to play alone, I definitely go into a dark world or a winter world. 
generally there are not many players in Winter Worlds. Right. I did go, one of the Dark Worlds I went into, I was like, this has got to have some good resources. Come on, this is a Dark World. <laughs> dark Worlds are bound to have good stuff. I found so much gold. Yeah. I was like, I went to this world because I wanted rose iron and blue steel. I, want, I came for high level materials and you're giving me sort of moderately low crap. I think stacks on stacks on stacks of moderately low level crap. I think in the uh, like in the dark the world, <laughs> in the dark worlds, it's more like castles, not really mines or caverns. I did find a mine, to be honest. There yeah. was a mine. It went really, really deep as well. It was kind of cool. And then there was a warlord at the far end guarding this room that had loads and loads of chests in it. All the chests had loads, and that had some rose iron in it. it had rose iron in the chests, various plates yeah. and weights and things. So that was kind of cool. That was actually a really cool mine to go into. But the amount of sort of the caves that branched off from that as well, I went down into them. I was like, I will explore all of these caves. <laughs> and they all had gold in it. And I just left so much behind. I, ca- I, I got over a stack of gold at that point. It was like, I've already got loads of gold and I've got another stack of gold ore here. I don't want all this gold, <laughs> but I wouldn't use this for anything other than just... M- at this point, I don't know, what am I going to do? Just wear gold armor just for the sake of looking blingy? But I... I use it whenever uh, a whenever it doesn't state a specific metal needs to be used in a in a leveling up XP kind of thing. Oh, well that's what iron's for, but hey. I don't I I have a lot more gold than I have iron. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, okay, fair enough. By quite a long stretch. If if I'd mined all of that stuff out of that level, I would have a lot more gold, but uh for me no iron is more abundant, so I have like 10 yeah. stacks of gold. And tons of bolts and bars and plates and weights. Yeah, that's just, it's just it gets a bit silly. Yeah. But they, I suppose that's that's for leveling up your you leveling up your skills, isn't it? You got all the bits. I think I think a lot of the iron I've got is just from breaking metal bars at some point, just going through and smashing up all the grates in fortresses and things. Because there's usually a room that's just like masses and masses and masses of metal bars, and it's just like I'm just going to go through and smash all of it up and pick up all the bars. And I've just got like three or four stacks of iron bars, and it's like if yeah. I want anything else made of iron, I'll turn them into ore, and then I'll get things out of the ore that way. It did not even occur to me to to smash up the level <laughs> until you did that while we were uh, recording. Oh right. <laughs> Not even occur to me at all, and now I do it all the time. Like I can say, it was the, the the developers on the official forums literally said that's how you're expected to get iron anyway. It's <laughs> like there, you, there isn't a lot of iron in the game. They literally expect you to go through and smash up stuff to take the iron out of it to use those <laughs> in your recipes. So that's how that's expected to work, and indeed to just get stacks and stacks and stacks of iron bars and craft that into ore, so that you can use the ore to make other things. That's effective. It works. It's well. I, I, it seems like a really weird way to do it to turn a bar back into ore to turn it into like a plate but yeah yeah very strange way of doing things but there you go so I've been going for long enough I think we should probably take a break here and we then we can come back and we can do some of the latest gaming news and upcoming releases for next week we'll be back after these messages from our sponsor not a mash podcast is back. Ah, we've missed that one. There's been many a week. Much time has passed since last we heard you, you sing that one. Well, it's back. It must be like over a month since you've sung that one. It is, actually. Because Will did the last one. I did it before that. <laughs> and then there was packs in the middle of that as well. So we were away for two weeks. That's uh, glad to know what I bring to this uh, podcast can be easily replaced. <laughs> well, you can encourage audience participation now. Well, I guess I have to now that I've lost my segues. Well, if you were really creative, you could segue into other things. We do more than link to other YouTube channels, you know. That would have been a good opportunity for you to do one. Oh, I don't work on your time. I work on mine. Tell me, Michael, what else does Button Mash do these days? Why, let me not tell you. Well, (laughs) screw you then. (laughs) Welcome back to the Button Mash podcast. Uh, We've got some gaming news and upcoming video gaming releases for you. And no gaming news and gossip. 
Uh, gaming news and gossip begins with... I've uh, got a couple of things about Steam and got a couple of things about Nintendo. Let's start with Steam, because everybody likes Steam. Except so, Nintendo. Except Nintendo. Well, I don't think they hate Steam, do they? I don't think there's, any, I don't think there's much competition the, between the two. I've heard it on the grapevine that Mario's put out a hit. On Gabe Newell. Or Gordon Freeman. Both. <laughs> Both, right. Okay. Well, maybe he's the con he's on the he's maybe he's been contracted by the guy who did. Um... Damn it! This would work better if I remember the name of the game. <laughs> the one, the the one, no, the guy that said he was going to kill Gabe Newell. Oh, oh that's called. Oh, oh Paranautical. Thank you. Yes, Paranautical Activity put out the hit on Gabe Newell, and they sent Mario after him. It's a me, a Mario. <laughs> Prepare to die. You're going to be swimming in your own agu. Indeed. So, Gabe Moving Newell. Swiftly, huh? Yes, because I know you stole that joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, the internet is there to be have things stolen from it. Uh, well, yeah. See Tabletop Simulator. Yep. See Segways. So Gabe Newell is talking about things that may or may not have been Half-Life, but kind of were Half-Life, but he didn't really oh, yeah. say Half-Life. He gave a very um, non-committal answer. <laughs> it was a very vague discussion. So yeah, he was a he spoke to uh, Jeff Keithley with a one-off podcast thing they did called Game Slice, and he they talked about a bit about the stuff they've done recently. But more interestingly, they, they talked about what they're doing in terms of making games. Because really, Valve, have, we've, I think we've talked about this ourselves a few times recently. Valve really haven't actually done much as far as actually you know making games these days. It's all steam machines and virtual reality and controllers that nobody asked for and things like that. So yeah, they've uh, not exactly. It's a struggle to remember the last thing they made was actually. I probably Dota, I guess, would be the last thing they put out. It was either Dota or Counter Strike Go. I'm not sure which. One of the two. They came. They came out around the same time, I think. And before that, Portal, I guess. Yeah. They've been quiet for a very long time. And was it was Portal Two before Half Life Two or after? I think it was after, wasn't it? After. After. And we definitely remember Portal Two because that yeah. was when we nearly died putting a portal on the building. Ah, uh, health and safety. <laughs> Non-existent health and safety. So yeah, that's. Uh, They've not done a lot noteworthy for a lot of people. I think it's more, they, they, they have made games, but I think it's the kind of people who are looking for a single player experience they've not done much for. If, if you're not into playing professional first person shooter type stuff like your Counter Strike, which is probably. I, I, I probably miscategorize it calling it professional, but I, I, I mentally file Counter Strike under a more sort of hardcore audience who, you know. It's more for. If you're a fan of the shooters, more than yeah, casual I mean, gaming. I feel like TF2 falls more into sort of the casual thing where you can sort of jump in and derp about and shoot flames at people and eat sandwiches and stuff. And yeah, it's not. It's a bit silly. Whereas Counter-Strike's a bit more serious business. I'm aware there is professional TF2 as well, but nonetheless, I think Counter-Strike perhaps gears itself more towards the professional audience. And then Dota's just, well, it's Dota. It's I know I know it's one of the biggest games out there. There's a lot of people who are like, you know what, I don't want to get into this, and I don't blame them. I am amongst them. It's not oh, a thing dear. I want to get into. So if you're into Valve's, you know, more traditional first person, not first person, and single player. That's what I'm looking for. Single player kind of model, the old Half Life stuff or the Portal stuff. Uh, even to, that's not necessarily a shooter. Even to, well, no, no, not necessarily. I think they're all they're all first person stuff. It's not necessarily an issue of that. It's just a matter of you don't want to be play. You don't want to have to play on a server with other people in a competitive environment. It's kind of more, more well, sort of narrative play, play the game story. For yourself. Yeah, if by yourself or maybe with a few friends. In the case of Left 4 Dead, and work through a single player or maybe cooperative thing. And Valve haven't done that for a while, and it's kind of what made them big at one point. So people want to know what's going on with it, and. Well, Gabe said, I don't know, it's very hard to interpret how he said it. He's, 
It's uh, the only reason we'd go back and do like a super classic kind of product, which is kind of hinting Half-Life, I suppose, is if a whole bunch of people just internally at Valve said they wanted to do it and had a reasonable explanation for why they did. So basically the team... Oh, the developers would have to be on board for wanting to it's make it. that ties yeah it kind of ties into valve's weird kind of corporate structure which is say everybody's allowed to do whatever they want and you know in order for half-life 3 or whatever to happen you'd have to have a significant majority of people at valve say you know what would be a really great project for us to work on let's do half-life 3 and everyone turns around and goes you know that sounds like a really good idea i like this and that. let's do half-life 3 and if they're all on board and you've got enough people on board to actually make a game happen then they can form the half-life 3 team and those guys can push all the de desks together and start working on the project together yep. and um, if no, yeah. i think we need to go on to the next part of the statement which is completely counteract <laughs> counteracts that yeah, he's saying that. That yeah, basically, he was saying that's the only reason why they would do it. But if you want to do another Half-Life game, naming the series by name there actually, and want to ignore everything we've learned in Shipping Portal 2 and in shipping all updates on the multiplayer side, that seems like a bad choice. So we'll keep moving forward, but that doesn't always necessarily always mean what people are worried that it might mean. Make of that particular minefield what you will. Uh, so yeah, it sounds like if they were going to do Half-Life 3 it probably wouldn't be more Half-Life the same as Half-Life 2 was, but a bit shinier. I don't think that would ever happen at this point. If they were going to do it, it would be something new and different. Which is and not necessarily bad, a bad thing. It wouldn't necessarily need to be a bad thing, but I don't think, and I've said this a bunch of times, I don't think that's what people would expect. I think what people would expect from Half-Life 3 is more Half-Life. And that doesn't sound like what Valve themselves want to work on. So, if they were to make Half-Life 3 and make it different, you would disappoint a very large amount of people and be shooting yourself in the foot. And I've said, I've said time and time again, and I will continue to say it, I don't think there's any way they can make Half-Life 3 and make it work. There's no way they can do Half-Life 3 and it won't, it won't turn out worse for them than if they didn't make it. I don't think it's a good business decision for them. Because there's too much riding on Half-Life 3 at this point. The hype train is too big. It, even though they've never announced anything about it, the player base around it has generated such a hype train around what it could be that anything they could deliver would never live up to any kind of expectation. And given that the expectation is this, to quote Gabe, super classic kind of product, the old school Valve kind of game, and Valve are no longer interested in making that kind of game, they're interested in making different games these days, I don't think they would make what the hype train wants the game to be. If you'll follow me. Yeah. So, seems like uh, we're not going to be getting it any time soon. I wouldn't, yeah, put it on your Christmas list anytime soon. No, it's not a sure bet. <laughs> I don't think Santa Newell is going to bring you it. So, yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's that, I suppose. Uh, I mean, I've said time and time again, I, I would love to see something else from them, and if they do, I'm... It's interesting that they never really said we are looking to make any, any kind of new single-player experiences either. They didn't really say what they are or aren't working on. On the whole, it's all very non-committal entirely. It was just like, if we were to work on this, this is why we would work on this. If we were to do this, this is why we would work on this. It's, there's, no, there's no real surefire, this is or isn't what we are or are not working on. You might as well have just gone on the podcast and shrugged. Yeah, yeah, might as well. I see. Even though the main driving point is is Half-Life 3 ever going to come out? Like I say, if they made any other single-player experiences, it would probably be a good game. Because Valve are good at making good games. They've proven themselves time and time again. I wouldn't be too bothered what they came up with, because it would probably be, be fairly innovative and fairly interesting, and I'd play it. And it would be good, I'm quite sure. But they haven't offered up any kind of information as to whether that's even a thing that they're actually going to do. Because, quite frankly, for the last year or so, probably two years now all they've done is steam universe and steam machines and steam controllers and things and so it's all been hardware and systems and things rather than 
games. There's not really been much in the way of games or anything to hint at games. But I suppose with the number of actual online games that they've got, uh, there's perhaps maybe there's parts of the, their actual game development teams are actually working towards supporting their free-to-play stuff and keeping new content going for... I know Counter-Strike isn't free-to-play, but a lot of their model isn't a million miles from the free-to-play model in spite of having to buy the game in the first place. And then Dota and TF2, they are the free-to-play model, and quite frankly, that's unsustainable if you don't keep new content coming. So they, their, you know, artists and game designers and things genuinely do have to keep adding stuff to those games. So that's probably an element of that as well. So that's that. Uh, in other Steam news, we've got uh, something that does affect us here at Buttermash here today. Sort of. Oh, no, don't say that. Well, I... Okay, I... If, I could not say it, but it still affects us. Uh, Steam now requires curators, and we are a curator, to disclose paid endorsements. And they're very vague about what that means. Do we have any paid endorsements? <laughs> yeah, you say that affects us. Um, that's what I'm saying. They're very vague about what that means. Technically, by their standards, we do. What? Technically, by their standards, pretty much all of our critique, or my critique at any rate, is a paid promotion. Because they count non-monetary rewards, such as free games, as being a... It's, let me read it out. If you use Steam services, e.g. the Steam Curators list, to promote or endorse a product, service, or event in return for any kind of consideration from a third party, including non-monetary rewards such as free games, you must clearly indicate the source of such con consideration to your audience. The new subscriber agreement states. Blah, 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 blah. So they're saying with their curator system, if you have accepted anything in return for your... your... your kind of your placement on the curator list, or broadcasting their stuff. I don't know who uses the broadcasting, but whatever. If, if they've given you anything in exchange for being in, on that curator list, uh, you have to note that. I mean, admittedly, they've not really given it in exchange. I, they just, they've made a good game, and I've said, oh, I am happy to recommend it, and they've given me the free game. But, but you know, by their standards, that sounds like they would count that. But that's kind of weird. I mean... Anybody who's doing any kind of critique professionally to any kind of standard, and I realise I'm just more enthusiast press than real press, but at this point the line's grey enough that I'm not sure it even matters. Uh, they are still coming to me as press and saying, here's a copy of our game for free so that you can take a look at it and critique it and say whether it's bad or good and tell your viewers and your audience whether it's bad or good. If it's bad, I'll tell people it's bad. If it's good, I'll tell people it's good, and I will recommend it, and I will put it on my curator list and say, Hey guys, this game's actually quite good. Here's a link to my review where you can get more information in depth. I think the biggest issue with this is, uh, the curator system is kind of crap. They're asking you to disclose information in the curator system, and the curator system only lets you use 156 characters to tell people why the game is good or bad. Or, generally speaking, it's supposed to be used for good, but some people do it bad as well, but whatever. So, you know, it's very, very hard to come up with a recommendation for something in a character limit that's, you know, in the same realm as Twitter. Yeah. You're trying to describe an entire video game on Twitter, effectively. Which is not easy to do. And then they're saying, oh yeah, a good part of that 156 characters means you should be telling people whether it's, whether it's a, essentially a paid promotion or not and yeah I don't know uh, I don't I don't know how you would do that that's takes up a lot of space and like I say you're, you're struggling to fit it in to begin with where the heck are you going to put that I mean I saw someone I think it was Total Biscuit in fact suggested uh, that you should just put hashtag prom paid promotion or hashtag Spon oh, hashtag sponsored, that was it. He was like, oh yeah, if you just put, put hashtag sponsored on it, that'll be fine. Uh, no. No, you wouldn't. That's because, because, of, because they're casting the net so broadly, they're saying that somebody who gets a review copy of a game should, put, should be classed as sponsored, alongside somebody who had, oh, I don't know, Ubisoft turned up on their doorstep with a big burlap sack with a dollar sign on the side of it full of money flowing out the top, and they're like, here, take this bag of money, just do a video of Assassin's Creed. Do that, does that just get a hashtag sponsored as well? Because they're clearly not so. on the same level. 
What about when EA flies everyone out to a aircraft carrier for a press preview event where they get wined and dined and told to play the latest Battlefield? Is that, is that a hashtag sponsored as well? Is that on the, is this really on the same level as a free review copy? That doesn't, that doesn't work. I don't think so, anyway. I don't know what you guys think. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. <laughs> I mean, if, if if they just let you write more on the curation page, it would at least go some way to alleviating it. Or, I don't know, had some kind of drop-down option for this is kind of, this is how this how I came by this review copy. I think that if you just put hashtag sponsored on all of your curation stuff, people are just going to ignore that recommendation anyway because it looks like they paid money for it. If you put, for the general consumer, if you have a box quote on the Steam page that says, yeah, this game's pretty good, you should really check it out, hashtag sponsored. People are just going to assume Ubisoft turned up with a bag of money for you to do that. Even if all hashtag sponsored means for you personally is that you got a review copy of the game so that you could have a look at it two days before launch. You know, like the press does. Standard procedure, you know. Mm. Yeah. So to call the call the two things comparable and just put a hashtag sponsored on both of them is thoroughly misleading to the public, quite frankly. It does a great... It, it's, it's unfair to the press and misleading to the consumer on both accounts, I feel. But, yeah, it doesn't quite solve the problem, does it? But at the same time, I'm not sure what the solution to the problem is. Like I say, just putting... I don't know, putting hashtag sponsored whatever... If I have to put free review copy in every thing, I don't know how many characters free review copy is. <laughs> free review copy. How many is that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So I'm down to 140 characters. If I put free review copy in my review, I'm down to 140 characters to begin with. If I put hashtag free review copy in, I'm down to 139. If I want a space before that and a full stop at the end of my sentence, I'm down to... Yeah, you get the picture. Uh, so, I'm not sure how I would put that into my things, and I'm not sure how anyone would, because, again, a lot of the people using the curator system, as the point of the curator system is, is that they're press. People who are using it are people on YouTube who are press. People who are work, write for magazines who are press. These people are getting free review copies because that's just how their business works. Nobody... It, it, there are too many games to either buy all the games or even be aware of all the games. The, the reason most of, it, most of the press are even aware of half the titles that come out is the fact that the developer goes here and thrusts it in your face by putting a copy there. That's how I know about half the games I get. I've never heard of them before they literally give me a copy of the game. And then I'll play it and I'll be like, oh, this is kind of good. I'll make some content about this so that I can tell people that it exists and it's kind of cool. That's press. That's how press works. But that is that that's a paid promotion according to Steam? Apparently so. I'm not on board with this, I don't think. But I'm not yeah, sure how it don't sound like you're supporting it. But I'm not sure how it's supposed to work. It's it's, it's untenable. Like I say, it's already li it's a limiting enough system as it is to begin with. And now to say, oh yes, yeah, you're supposed to actually take up half the space telling people that you got a free, that, you know, standard procedure happened for you to promote this game. Yeah. It, I mean, if, if someone dr does drop a big bag of cash on you uh, in order to promote it, I don't think you're in a position where you should be putting it on the curator list in the first place anyway. Mm. Yeah, and I will true. say, I'm not going to name any names, but I have seen some big names that have like, recommended games, and then when you click on it, it's like, oh yeah, this is a paid promotion from so-and-so. And it's like, y I can't trust your recommendation then. That's not a recommendation. They literally paid a lot of money for you to go, hey, play this game. This is a really cool game. So you putting your curation thing up there, I can't trust you. That's, no. No good. Yeah, which is fair. I, I, I literally think the, I was going to say, rather than disclosing paid endorsements, it should literally be Steam. Steam does not allow you to put paid endorsements on the curation system, but free review copies I don't think would count. I've seen one or two really small people who are like, oh, by the way, guys, I pay for all my review copies. And I'm like, so? 
All that means is you're actually covering less content than your competitors. If the only things you're prepared to cover are the things you pay for yourself, well, you're limiting yourself there. I recognize if you're if you're at the level where you're actually running as a business, you can you, know, you can claim it back from your taxes on a biz as a business expense, I suppose. But for a, certainly, so your small to intermediate level, the kind of enthusiast level, there's no way that's viable. It's not sustainable. It can't. No, it can't work in the long run. You can't. You can't afford to buy your games just so that you can turn around and say, "By the way, I buy all my game copies." And quite frankly, if you're claiming it back of your tax at the end of the year, what the hell's the difference between a free review copy and you paying the game and getting the money back for the game at the end of the tax year anyway? Essentially, you're getting the game free either way. So who cares which way you got it? It is pointless. It is utterly pointless. Hmm. Well done, Valve. <laughs> He's too busy doing that to make Half-Life 3. Yeah, they're too busy faffing about with shit like that than making Half-Life 3, absolutely. So, Nintendo, let's look at Nintendo instead. Maybe Nintendo have got more positive things going on, sort of, maybe. Smiles to faces. Nintendo have announced that they're going to announce another console. Well, they've, they've announced a bunch of announcements and stuff and then teased some bits and pieces. Uh, so they they have they've mentioned that the, they're going to do some dedicated gaming hardware codenamed the NX. Interesting. But there's no information on what that is or what it could be, uh, other than that they're going to tell you more about it next year. So it's going to be another nine months before we find out anything more about it anyway. So yeah, there's NX. Speculate. What's an NX? Will, another what do you think an, Will, what another, do you think an NX is? Another excuse to make another Mario Kart? Does it end, <laughs> end for another, another excuse? Yep. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's well, Nintendo's cash cow, that. I suspect that's true. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, I, I heard some people saying the X could be 10, because it's like Nintendo's 10th system. It depends how you count that Maybe. one, because you have to fudge the numbers a bit to make that one work. N isn't a Roman numeral, though. Yeah, but like Nintendo 10 or something. Right, okay. NX, Nintendo 10 or something. Uh, it's like If you go through the handheld ones, it's like, yes, if you don't include some handhelds. <laughs> <laughs> because they've done so many iterations of so many things. It's like, oh, there's a Game Boy and the Game Boy Color. Are they, they kind of the same thing, but not entirely the same thing? I mean, there were some color games that weren't on the standard one, so maybe they're separate. Uh, then we've got the Game Boy Advance and the Game Boy Advance SP and the Game Boy Micro. Which all kind of played the same thing, but then I don't think the. But then at the same time, I think the micro was supposed to be its own thing as well, and wasn't supposed to be a version of the GBA, in spite of it only playing GBA games. And then you've got the DS and the DS Lite and the DS XL and the 3DS and the 3DS Lite and 3DS XL and the DSi and then the new 3DS and all of the other combinations of letters that they could possibly find for that. Which ones of those count? Is the DS, I mean, was the DSi sufficiently different to the DS to make it a new console? I don't know. Um, maybe? <laughs> I think the 3DS, uh, you could say DS and 3DS. And then there's the new 3DS, which does play different games to the 3DS. If you only have a 3DS, they're releasing games now that can't be played on it that say 3DS on them. But you need a new 3DS in order to play the new 3DS games. Thanks, Nintendo. Simple to understand, I know. Uh, and then some people are like, oh, it's way too soon for them to make a new blah, 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 blah. I mean, the Wii U hasn't been out a massively long time. It's only been a couple of years. It's been, it's been longer than most people realize, I think, but uh, it hasn't been out that long. And then the 3DS, obviously, they've literally just done the new 3DS. So which of those would they be more likely to iterate? The 3DS itself has been around for a while, and they've just put out a new one which does play unique software on it. So it's the games that won't run on the 3DS. So are they likely to be making a new handheld? Is it too soon? At the I same time, I feel like... too too soon for a handheld. 
At the same time, they put out the DS really, really, really hot on the heels of the Micro as well. They were like, the Micro is this whole standalone thing and it's supposed to be entirely, it's its, it's, it's, its own unique product and it's, you can buy it and it will play different games. And uh, anybody who owned a GBA was like, well, I already own a GBA, so I don't need to buy it. And to the Micro's credit, it's actually a really nice little like, bit of hardware. But at the time, the market of people who already owned a GBA were like, I don't need another GBA that's even smaller than the one I have. The one I have is reasonably large, but it fits my pocket too, not too badly. I fit my GBA in my pocket. That's all I needed. And the, the SP. Actually, I like the SP's form factor, the, the GBA SP. That's got a good form factor on that thing. And then they did the micro and it's like, eh, I don't need to buy that, especially as the DS is coming out in about a month's time. There wasn't very little time between the micro and the DS. So it's not unheard of for Nintendo to put out two new things really, really quick together. Mm. So, I don't know. I don't entirely rule out a handheld on that basis, because I've seen what Nintendo have done with handhelds before. I guess a Wii would be more likely. I don't know, maybe it's the Wii U has not quite taken off in the way they've hoped, and they're like, shit, make another one that's better. <laughs> make an NX, make the NX. I was going to say, yeah, the 3DS is, you know, selling hotcakes. People people love the 3DS, people are buying those, those are great. Uh, Wii U is, I still don't think it's quite taken off quite like they would like it to. And I guess the part, part of the issue with that is they're really, really struggling with third-party support. A lot of the stuff on the Wii systems at the minute is mostly just... Nintendo making their own stuff, and there is a limit to how fast they can put stuff out. It's like, there's a. Maybe if they made another F Zero, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> that's good for that F Zero. <laughs> if they make another F Zero, that'll solve all their problems. I'm, I'll, I swear by that. Stop making Mario Kart, Nintendo. Stop making, stop making Mario Kart. We don't need Mario Party Ten. What we need is Mario, not Mario. We need a uh, F Zero. We X, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not in charge of naming games. <laughs> I'm just telling you what to make. Yeah, they've got they've got so many they've got so many IPs that they don't use. But at the same time, yeah, obviously there's a limit to how many things they could make first party wise. I do think they could stand to diversify a little bit more because they've got the IPs that they don't use. But at the same time, yeah, whatever it's their call, it's their console. They just need to... I don't, I, don't know, I don't know why. I've never quite grasped why the third-party developers have kind of branched away. Is it just that they don't have the power compared to the other consoles? So that, you know, when someone's like, oh, we're putting out the latest Assassin's Creed and it can display 200 peasants at once. And it's like, well, we can't put it on the Wii because it can't display 200 peasants in Paris or wherever. Maybe it's just... Um... Not that the Xbox or PS4 could either, but hey. Maybe it's just because there's an common conception that xbox and um ps4 are just the superior brands and the brands people go to so the weed kind of gets left uh, by the wayside it's almost a soft self-fulfilling prophecy that way though if you're not making games for the wii no one's going to buy a wii <laughs> The developers need to make something on it before people buy those consoles. They can't say, oh, nobody's buying that console. I'm not going to make anything for it. Well, no, because you decided to make your game on the PS4. So if people want to play your game, they're going to have to go on the PS4 for it. Of course they didn't buy the Wii. Nobody, everybody decided for some reason at some point that they didn't want to make games for it. Which is a very strange state of affairs. Oh, well. There is, I, I'm, I've not read the article thoroughly. There's just a, there is a graphic at the bottom of this uh, Polygon article that we've got, which um, I'm not sure if this is supposed to be like Nintendo's lineup, but they've got 3DS, Wii U, the NX, and then on the other side they've got tablet, smartphone, and PC. And I'm like, hang on, wait, what? What has Nintendo got to do with PC? Don't tell me Nintendo was making a PC. I, I, I would. That would be kind of cool if Nintendo went into PC games. I won't say no. It would be fascinating. <laughs> I would be intrigued to see what they did. Yeah, seriously. I mean, hey, I mean, Sega just gave up making hardware and started putting their stuff on other stuff. So that would be a major decision for Nintendo to do, but I wouldn't object to seeing that. It's like, oh, let's not make any more Wiis. Let's just make them and put them on PC and Xbox. I would fully support that. Mario Kart on PC. <laughs> The only way I would ever play another Mario Kart. Hmm. 
As a, there is this, there is a quote here from uh, Satoru Iwata, which is, Nintendo comes together with DNA, who is the mobile game developer they're partnering with, will jointly develop a new membership service which encompasses the 3DS, Wii U systems, new hardware system NX, smart devices and PCs, and Nintendo will be the primary party to operate this new membership service. What that actually means, I'm not really sure. But it sounds like they're steering a little bit away from, you know, their own sort of little enclosed Nintendo sort of thing. Because let's be honest, even multi-platform stuff, when it's multi-platform, it doesn't seem to tend to end up on Nintendo stuff very often. They're very kind of insular, I think is the word I'm looking for. Hmm. Nintendo stuff tends to stay Nintendo stuff. And then occasionally you get stuff like Bayonetta, which is still Nintendo stuff. It didn't end up on any other consoles, so <laughs> wait, what? Yeah. Very strange. Uh, so the other one is, uh, of course, what we just briefly tw uh, touched on, which is Nintendo looks to release its first mobile game this year. Which is partnering up, as I say, with Japanese mobile company DNA. Uh, and probably not much more information than that, but apparently Nintendo are now looking to do something on mobile? Which is, I guess, the first foray into a PC game? Well, I wouldn't call mobile PC gaming, but it's in the same kind of thing. If they're kind of steering away from their existing platforms, you can see how it could tie into PC stuff, I suppose. But I think it's one of those things that you uh, occasionally see people make, like, photoshopped images of what Mario would be like if it was free to play and stuff. And it's riddled with microtransactions and stuff. And it's like, it, it, I think if nothing else, it will, will be interesting to see how Nintendo handles it. Oh yeah, it'll be, it'll be an experience. What does a Nintendo mobile title look like? Are they going to go down the same route as, you know, all its competitors and just make Clash of Clans and Angry Birds, or... Mario Kart for the... <laughs> or, or are they actually just straight up actually going... Or are they going to make a game that you have to buy and it's a really solid product in its own right? I mean, hey, that's okay. I don't. I fully support developers that just want to make a game that's really cool and sell you that game on mobile. It's like, here you go, pay, pay, th pay two or three quid, and there you go. You've got a game, and it's a really cool game. I'm, I'm on board with that. But not many seem to really look to do that. I hope Nintendo does that. I really do. I hope they do. But I mean, to be fair, they've given that they've had, they've got their own platforms. They've had. They've had opportunity to do free-to-play stuff in the past if they ever wanted to. But Nintendo are always kind of... They are a very traditional kind of company. They don't tend to be tend to be the sort of people who do new and innovative stuff. Certainly in kind of that kind of market. They, they sort of... They like to innovate with hardware, it seems, but... They're not very progressive in other, other, other areas. So, I don't know. Speculate away! Yeah. It'll be interesting to see what uh, could they come up with. I suppose, I suppose the PC thing is, is uh, again, again, because we don't know what it is, it's like they're saying it's an online membership service accessible from Windows PC. What does this mean? Is this just, uh, is this just Xbox Live for Nintendo? Which, Maybe? again, to be fair, beats the shit out of their existing friend code system. If they want to actually have some kind of account that you would use to play your games on, I guess that certainly a step forward in terms of online gameplay for Nintendo stuff. How strange. How strange. Very strange. It's fascinating. Nintendo are catching up with the rest of the world. Maybe a little too late. I don't know. Well, Let's move on to gaming. Oh, well, sorry. At least we're trying. Uh, let's move on to gaming releases, shall we? And now, gaming releases! So, starting with what limited stuff we know about consoles, we have Bloodborne out on March 24th. Which I know is something Suresh has been on about for a while, I'm not rightly sure what it is. Something about vampires, right, isn't it? I think. Everything's about vampires these days. Uh, when it's not about zombies. <laughs> It's oh no he, no it is more zombies I think isn't it it's, it's 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 a plague which is well surprisingly enough bloodborne dun, dun, dun. so you are now I guess, I guess it's kind of a RPG kind of thing where you're trying to 
get a cure for a plague, which is uh, presumably bloodborne. And you must attempt to do it without losing your humanity in the process, apparently. I think I think it's uh, I think it's similar to the souls kind of thing, so actually it might be Will's kind of Will's kind of deal. I I have specifically stayed away from not looking at this game because it's PS4 exclusive. Oh, I know I'll, right. I'll never be able to play it. Ah, uh, okay. And I know it looks amazing, but Oh, it is actually the same guys who made uh, Souls, isn't it? Is it? I don't know. From Software, from Software's Souls, right? I don't know what Souls is. Dark Souls, Demon Souls. Oh, right, I see. The in Souls case, games. A, in that case, it'll be an amazing game. Yes, From Software released Dark Souls 2 to critical acclaim. Yes, it is the same guys who made Dark Souls, and it's similar-ish kind of stuff, I guess. Then I guess I'll be buying a PS4. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll be dear. coming to Butter Mash. <sighs> I, would, I would gladly send it over to Butter Mash if I ever got one. Oh, well, uh, now that we've committed Will to buying expensive hardware, <laughs> uh, we got Borderlands The Handsome Collection, Ooh. which is a collection of Borderlands 2 and Borderlands the pre-sequel, with a four-player split-screen mode for consoles. Good lord, mm. people actually willing to make support for that? Good for, good for them. Yeah, very Still not interested in playing it, but good for them. <laughs> uh, yeah. Spirit. Hey, Borderlands 1 was good. I didn't get into Borderlands 2, and I sure should have no interest in anything else going forward. Uh, Lego Ninjago Shadow of Ronin. Which is Lego something ninjas? Yes, they have a ninja brand that we're not aware of. I, I guess they do have a ninja brand, yes. It presumably plays reasonably similar to a lot of the other Lego stuff I would have wagered if, if anything. Yeah, I it's imagine like, it's pretty much like any other Lego game that's yes. out there. That is for the Vita, if you're looking for more stuff for the Vita in case all the Japanese fan service stuff wasn't doing, doing it for you. Metal Slug 3! Very re-releasing from 2000. On all the uh, uh, no. PS networks? And the PS4. Uh, yeah, it's only PS3, PS4 now. What's it? Damascus Gear Operation Tokyo. It's a Vita game. It's probably got some anime in it. it sounds like it does. And it's a hack and slash mech combat game. Okay. Still Japanese, but okay. So, uh, yeah. Nothing else on it, so I can't really tell you much. There's no screenshots or anything. It's more Vita stuff. Like I say, it's been, it's been a good year or so for Vita, though. If you oh, want yeah. stuff on there. Uh, Matt Mania. Oh, this one for you, Michael. Oh, was this a... This is a 1985 arcade wrestling game. Oh, this looks like a proper <laughs> wrestling. This doesn't look like professional wrestling. <laughs> this is... The Pro Wrestling Network, Matt Mania. So... That, this PS, is, if I had a PS4, I'd be getting on this bad boy, but I don't. You could get this and Bloodborne. And they're very similar, I hear. <laughs> Same thing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Look it. <laughs> so this is a, a, a Japanese arcade game from 1985, which has been re-released on PlayStation 4, presumably due to overwhelming demand. Yeah, I, I can see, I can see WWE shaking in their boots at this. Yeah, of Armored Core, which again is PlayStation One classic, 1997, re-releasing PS3 on PlayStation Network. Three actually. Uh, Dead or Alive, PlayStation 2 Classic, also releasing on PS3. A PlayStation They're, just having a clear out month. <laughs> they've been doing this for a while. We've got a few of these every week pops up. It's like PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2 Classics. They're popping up on new consoles. Although, you know, it's like, so you, you know, PlayStation 2 games on PlayStation 3. It's not that classic. It wasn't that old. Mm. But hey. Although I suppose... Oh, jeez, actually. I suppose this is a game from 2000 re-releasing in 2015, so there's a bit of a gap, but, you know, just between the consoles themselves, you know, they are consecutive consoles. Yeah. 2013, Infected Wars, really releasing in 2015. I think this one took them a little longer to make than they anticipated, perhaps. Ever so slightly. This is a zombie third-person shooter developed by Action Mobile Games. I think we can thoroughly... Give that one a miss. Oh, it's on the Vita. I guess it already came out on tablets and shit. And now they're doing it for the Vita. 
Can't really tell you much about it, I don't think there's... Oh, we have one picture, I want to see what the picture is. Is it the logo? Yes, yes it is. Thank God we looked at that picture. The logo's really shittily done as well. It's not the best. No. It's not a good logo. Uh, we've got Your B, episode one, Payback's a Bolt. I uh, like the pun. <laughs> it's a 3D twin stick shooter where Your B, the robot, must take on the forces of the evil Dr. Zox. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you heard me. Another reason to buy a PS4, are you? There is a robot wearing orange shades. Which is fantastic. And it's made by Happy Dance Games. Buy it now. Game of the year. Calling it now. <laughs> it looks awesome. <laughs> to be fair, it's twin stick shooters. I probably would enjoy it, actually, if I gave it a chance <laughs> and had a PS4, but hey. Another reason to buy one. We, uh, now all, Slen, um, we now all have a reason to buy a PS4. Yes, absolutely. Club you together can, and buy one. Yes. So we can play Bloodborne, which yep. probably would be quite good. You can play <laughs> Matt Mania, and I'll play Yorby. I think I got the short end of the stick there, actually. Hey, yeah. I don't mind if you guys want to front up 100 quid each. <laughs> so not I can play w- Bloodborne. Uh, I, I don't think I want... No, I'm not really that committed to Yorby, <laughs> if I'm honest. <laughs> Uh, Slender the Arrival this is is, oh yeah this is not new this is two years old now oh it's it's the sequel to the first Slender isn't it it's already two years old and it's coming out on your bone and PS4 in case you really really wanted Slender on your bone now there's an expression (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Pillars of Eternity is a oh it's a Oh, it's Obsidian Entertainment's new RPG thing. I've had a few people talking about this. I think it's supposed to be quite good. So, Ob- Obsidian... Oh, what have they made? I know the name. They made a lot of stuff. Oh, they did, uh, they did Neverwinter Nights. They did oh. Fallout New Vegas. Uh, South Park? Apparently they did the South Park thing. I didn't know they did that. Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2. I did a bunch of fairly noteworthy things then. So, yep, they've uh, they've done some fairly noteworthy things now. That's, uh, that's a new game from them, so I think people will be fairly interested in that. I did not get a review copy of that, but I've seen a few people that I know playing it lately, so I think I think review copies have been doing the rounds. Um, what else we got? Uh, Forza Horizon 2 Fast and Furious. Which... Oh god, really? Apparently promotes the latest <laughs> Fast and the Furious film, Furious 7. Which is depressing, because I didn't know they were up that high with Furious films. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they did like four. So, yeah, apparently they're up to seven on that one, I guess. I didn't know that. So yes, it is, and now you can play Forza to promote it or something. Sorry, did you have something to add there? No, I just... No. Uh... Stopped watching after Tokyo Drift, I think. Which one was that one? Three, maybe? Alright. I, 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 I don't think I've three. seen it. I think that is mm-hmm. three, yeah. Alright. I don't think I don't think I've seen any of them, so yeah. No we lots. Got up to the point where the rock gets in. <laughs> right. Oh god, yeah. <laughs> and we have Star Ruler, which is a four X game. Star Ruler two is a four X game developed by Blind Mind Studios. And there's next to no information on it whatsoever. I guess if it's number two, they must have at least made a previous one that must have done okay. I say, oh, it's already out on Steam Early Access. It is due to transition into a full product on March 27th. So that's that. Uh, Let's move on to Steam releases. No jingles? No nothing? No, I I won't do I won't subject you to the jingle. Aww. All right. And now... Steam releases. Sorry, I mean, your what? sound effect is just a jet of steam or something. Yeah. You do that. I'm sorry, I don't know what the hell that was. I turned into Gollum. <laughs> My Steams is. My Steam games. Yes. Alrighty. Uh, we've got Runestone Keeper, which is a thing okay. about runestones. Is, is it a really? roguelike dungeon crawler? Because we don't have enough of those yet. Thank God the world. 
Uh, they do have they do have the banner at the top of the page that says this was a Steam Greenlight game, which uh, you know, most of those games don't put that banner there. It's like there's very rare that you actually see that these days, in spite of like 99% of the games on Steam being Greenlight ones now. It's pixel art. It's dungeon crawling. It's roguelike. You've probably played a lot of things very like it in recent history, if I'm completely honest. <laughs> Just a thought. Uh, we got, ah, tying into something we were playing earlier. World of Subways 4, New York Line 7. Well, this is your game, Joe. Yes, this is Subway Simulator. This is literally Subway Simulator. And now you can drive a subway down New York, I guess. Uh, I do seem to recall we in, we mentioned a launch of like the German one, a few, uh, possibly Berlin, I presume Berlin, uh, a few months back. So yes, now New York is out. Who's buying these that they made four <laughs> of them? It doesn't even look good. Also, I'm, I don't know if this is intentional, but they've kind of... They, if you guys are watching the trailer for this, they've kind of got this weird visual glitch thing that makes it look like they're trying to be watchdogs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what, are we going to hack into trains here? Or, are you, or have you just made a really shitty trailer? I'm not sure which it is. Either that or my computer is about to die, one of the two, and I presume it's just the trailer that's going to Oh, weird. it's happening to me too. <laughs> some stellar, stellar stuff. This is some hardcore subway. <laughs> I don't know. If I can crash trains, that might make it slightly redeeming. <laughs> I have no idea whether you can or not. Uh, we have Walkover, which is a free-to-play thing. Team up with your comrades to stand against the pesky aliens. I... I'm not even sure what I'm looking at. It's a top-down shooter, I guess. A free-to-play cooperative top-down shooter? I'm not sure how this is going to work or how it's monetized for a free-to-play thing. Yeah, it looks a bit weird. It looks very similar to a lot of sort of top-down zombie things I've played in the past, to be fair. Actually... Call me crazy. Actually. I think I think a lot of the stuff looks like a lot of stuff doesn't look a million miles dissimilar to like RPG Maker style graphics. <laughs> <laughs> Just the way it, the levels are like laid out and sort of created, it feels like an RPG Maker thing. Which, to be fair, actually, if they managed to put a top, if they managed to make RPG Maker into a top-down shooter, kudos to them. That's quite impressive. <laughs> I will say that much. Uh, what else we got? We've got... Oh, we talked about this one last week. Twelve Labours of Hercules. Which has a lot Hercules. of cheese in it. <laughs> Hercules and his cheese. Whoa, he was hungry. Hercu cheese. <laughs> I'm sorry. That, I, think that's, <laughs> I think that was the sequel to the Disney Hercules film. <laughs> uh, I I don't think we ever did figure out what this was. I know Tolka spent a long time ranting about it last week, at which point we were just staring at the cheese. Yeah. And I really don't know what it was. All we, all we figured out was that there was cheese. It's a time management game. I don't know what that involves, but it involves cheese. Hercules has got to uh, time manage his cheese. Cheese management simulator. Bake it. Che valve. Che valve. Che <laughs> cheese simulator 2015. Valve's next game, yeah. <laughs> I'm going into Valve and pushing my desk next to Gabe and going, Gabe! <laughs> yeah, that's on Nintendo's first mobile title. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, out of the Park Baseball 16! This is about tells, baseball, by any chance. This is baseball, and it tells me that the annual iterations of these games are getting far too early in the year if Out of the Park 16 has come out in March 15. Yeah, that's a bit strange. <laughs> so... That's, normally they sort of roll out towards the back end of the year for whenever. I don't know, when does the baseball season start? I actually have no idea. No, I don't know. I guess if the 2015-2016 season, if that is the baseball season and that's how it works, if that starts around March, I guess you could make an argument for it, but I don't feel like it was that long since we announced baseball 15, to be quite honest. Yeah, you would expect it to still be on 15, wouldn't you? For at least a little while longer, yeah. 
No idea. Baseball. Not. If you like baseball, it's probably baseball. We're guessing. There's my box quote for you. <laughs> <laughs> if you like baseball, it's probably baseball. It's good. <laughs> Uh, we've got Life is Strange Episode 2, does not show up in the Steam list, but that one did catch, uh, I did remember this, like, just as we are about to go live, we were like, hang on, there's something that's not on our Steam releases that I feel like probably should be noted, because I'm going to be playing the shit out of it, because it'll probably be quite good. Um, I don't know, actually, I, I thought it was genuinely well received, but then I've heard a lot of people really bad-mouthing it lately, and I'm like, oh, I thought everyone liked Life is Strange. I liked Life was Life is Strange. It was strange. Definitely. It was, yeah, but it looked I up to the title. It. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I'll, definitely. I'll definitely be working my way through the episodes. Hmm. Well, unless they, you know, jump the shark and turn shit, but hey. <laughs> so you think it's going to be a happy days kind of thing? Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know whether I want to buy the episodes one at a time or whether I should just... I, I mean, it's only, there's only like two pounds in it, difference between buying them all at once and just buying the episodes individually anyway, so... I might just buy them individually, and then if it turns out episode three is a pile of poop, then I might give four and five a miss. I don't know. I'll be buying them individually, just because. Yeah. I thought you. I thought you already bought this season pass, didn't you? Nope. No. Oh, okay. I, was, I, I thought you said you'd had. No, I was going to, but then decided against. Because I mean, monies. Yes, because monies. Even if even if you get screwed in the long run. Which is, I believe, Adobe's new business model. <laughs> and actually, uh, Epic's new business model with Unreal 4 as well. Yes, you can use it for free. We just need 5% of all your money forever. <laughs> okay. Um, where were we? I've lost our place in things. So, oh yes, Life is Strange. Glorkian Warrior next. Which, yeah, that's... Strange. I feel like it's. I don't know. Just looking at it, I get the impression it's kind of designed to appeal to your kind of adventure time kind of crowd, maybe. Really? I don't know. It's just the really kind of random, bizarre, cartoony, strange, yeah. lol, so random humor in a lot of cases. It's Gallagher style shoot 'em up. Um, but then. Yeah, super Saturday morning cartoon kind of thing, with a lot of really silliness going on. I feel like I can probably give it a miss, because I'm not big on that kind of stuff, really. Uh, VRC Pro, which is driving remote control cars. Yeah. In case you're really into driving remote control cars, but don't want to do it in real life or something, <laughs> I guess? I really like these remote control cars, but I don't like them to be so real. If only they're a little bit more virtual. I suppose they got some fairly impressive tracks to drive them around, which I suspect you might not get in your backyard. But then again, I'm not really into the RC scene, so I don't know. Maybe there is. Maybe RC does get like super hardcore, and people do race them around tracks with like those. It looked like there was like a half pipe kind of thing in there at one point. I don't doubt it, actually. So, yes. Uh, it actually does look surprisingly hardcore. There's, like, graphs of aerodynamics and things in there, so... <laughs> it's probably very much in, uh, geared at your enthusiast more so than anything else. And I don't doubt that enthusiasts will probably take some take attention to this. Uh, we have Sky Battles. Which is a description that sounds like Guns of Icarus, quite frankly. Uh, we've got... It's... Flying planes around and fighting giant monsters? Looks about right. That actually mm. looks kind of cool. I won't lie. <laughs> Taking on, like, a kraken in, like, <laughs> a plane. That's kind of cool. That's It's almost a little bit of Shadow of the Colossus kind of thing, I guess. Yeah. It's just fight giant monsters, except now you're going to do it in a plane. All right. Shadow of the Colossus in a plane, I guess. I could certainly get behind that concept. Sure. Uh, Discourse. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. I'll definitely be, be picking this one up. It's a... I guess that when it comes down to it, it's just a choose-your-own-adventure kind of thing. Uh, it's really great style. I love the style of this thing. And it's, yeah, you wake up after, like, a plane crash on an island and have to survive on the island. 
And forgive me if you've heard the plot of this before, because it's a little bit like Lost. <laughs> I was just going to say, is it Lost? Yeah. I'll say, actually, uh, the uh, Indie Mega Booth curator description that shows up on the page is, it's like Lost, but with less smoke creatures. <laughs> Uh, this is about by Alchemy Labs, who did. They've done a bunch of other cool stuff before. They did. Oh, they did. A, they did a smuggle truck, which got banned by Apple because it involved smuggling illegal immigrants in, and Apple didn't like <laughs> political games. So they just replaced all the immigrants with fluffy animals and called it Snuggle Truck. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Which was quite impressive. Uh, uh, I think that was these guys. I'm pretty sure. Was they, I know they did Jack Lumber as well. I enjoyed which, that game. Oh, you played that one? Yeah, oh, yeah, that was good. That's cool, yeah. That's a good, good little game. Uh, so, yeah, they've done some cool stuff. I like I like Alchemy. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for a while. So, I didn't realise this was coming up quite so soon, so, yes. Definitely want to play that. Uh, from there we have Infinite Crisis, which I have seen the logo before. They definitely had a big booth at PAX, but I don't think I'd ever quite clocked what it was. No, I... Uh, They've this sounds really good, interesting. Got some good cinematics, but then the rest of the things is just artwork. Well, it's it's DC MOBA. It's Batman <sighs> in a MOBA for some reason, and I don't know. That sounds kind of cool. You just got you know, like your League of Legends or whatever, but mm. instead you've got like Batman and Superman fighting each other and shit. And whoever else is in DC's library, because quite frankly, I'm not all that familiar with DC works. I'm not into my comic books, so uh, someone else could go through it better. I'm mostly picking up most of the characters from the trailer. You got Superman in there, you got Batman in there, you got the Joker in there. I don't recognize many of the others. I guess the Superwoman as well. But I don't know. I, if this is, is this one free to play? I would be tempted to give that a go, actually. I might install that and see, to be honest. I mean, I'm not really into any MOBAs to any great extent. Uh, and for whatever reason, even though I'm not into comic books to any great extent, I don't know, that just sounds kind of kind of interesting. I'd like to see, I'd like to see what that actually entails. Cool. Uh, we have... what else we got? We have Ethereum. Ethereum being a science fiction real-time strategy with three factions. So it's StarCraft, I guess. Sounds like it. It is... Okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it. I can't find anything that makes it sound not like StarCraft. <laughs> you are battling over a rare and mysterious resource called Ethereum, surprisingly enough. Yeah. Sci-fi units duking it out. Cool, if you like RTS. I, I, suppose, I suppose from a certain perspective, people do keep saying, oh yeah, there's not enough of those traditional RTSs around, so they might see some traction in that regard, So because people are like, it's still really the only thing to play. So there's Grey Goo came out recently, but beyond that, most people are still just playing StarCraft 2. And actually, with that in mind, I think the next part of StarCraft 2 is due out soon as well. If not, like, this week, maybe? I don't really kept an eye on when the release date for that was. It may even already be out. I'm not sure. I'm not. Don't follow my. I don't follow StarCraft. But I believe that's soonish, around nowish. I think that's a vague enough expression that I can get away with it, right? Or do I need to be vaguer? Uh, Pillars of Eternity. Oh, I already touched on that one recently on the other list, didn't we? Uh, I will mention just because this is. Here, I don't. It doesn't have a release date on it, uh, which is annoying me. But it does show up in the Steam release delay release list as being this week, and I'm hoping it's this week. Uh, but there's Ironcast, which we looked at a while back because we I called it Steampunk Puzzle Quest, and I was like, oh, I really want a good Puzzle Quest game, and I played this at PAX. I actually met the developer, and the re developers from somewhere near London, I think. And they were all dressed up in steampunk, and I was wearing my mm. steampunky hat. So, so they were like, oh my god, you're a steampunk. That's cool. Awesome. Do you want to play our game? And I was like, yes, yes, I do. 
so I spoke to them. He said he was going to send me a review copy over, which I suppose I should disclose on my curator page. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, but yeah, what I played at PAX, I quite enjoyed. So yeah, I would love to take a better look at this. Yeah, if this is out this week, like I said, there's no release date on Steam here for it, but I hope it's out this week. Tell you what, I'm just going to Google this just for just for just for just that I know. Uh, do they have? Do they actually have a web page? That would be a really useful one for them to have. They, I could just go through Steam. That would work, wouldn't it? Available. Oh, that one's their web page still says early 2015. Do they have a press kit with a release date on? God damn it, guys! Tell us when your game's out, because I want to know. You don't um, need to know. I need to know these things. Twitter. Tell me on your Twitter. Guys, <laughs> your Twitter page must have... No, their Twitter page still... Oh, yeah, can't wait till launch next week. Yeah, that was a couple days ago. If not yesterday, in fact. Yeah, okay, I think it's out soon. And I definitely want to take a look at that. That's kind of cool. Uh, we have uh, Spirits of Xanadu. Which Xanadu. is... Do, do, do. I don't think that's the same thing. It's something about space. It's a kind of a minimalistic looking thing. There's a lot of just big geometric shapes and plain colors and things. And yet, I'm not sure what I'm, not sure what I'm making out. It's certainly a first person shooter thingy. I'm not sure if there's any horror elements to it. There's like blood streaks up walls and things though, so. Not sure what we're looking at here. Guys, what are you making of it? Mm. I'm not all shout at once. Hmm? Looks a bit well, shit, if I'm honest. Yeah. It's not the most. I don't know. Brilliant thing I've ever seen. Okay, well, moving on. Uh, Pixel Puzzles 2 Anime! <laughs> I think we'll all be all over that one. Oh, yeah. This is jigsaw puzzles from the same people who presumably brought us Pixel Puzzles to Birds, which involved doing jigsaw puzzles of dead birds, if memory serves. <laughs> <laughs> which is exactly what you want to do jigsaw puzzles of. Except now you can do it of anime girls, which is just... Right. The mind boggles at the games that exist in the world these days. But it's there. If you ever thought, I really wish there were more jigsaw anime girls, anime games in the world... There is now. You may rest easy at night. Uh, we have Keebles, which is a physics-based vehicle building puzzle game. Which sounds not dissimilar to a lot of things that have been out lately, although this is 2D. I think a lot of things have been kind of 3D. Oh, uh, it's it's kind of one of the... Uh, I don't know, actually, actually, looks like World of Goo. I was just going to say that, actually. Yeah, it's got a very <laughs> much of a World of Goo kind of vibe going on. Yeah. yeah. There are literally blobs of goo and lots of stringy sticks holding blobs of other things together. Yeah. It's... I mean, I've seen a few kind of vehicle building things. You get those kind of wacky contraption type games that are like, oh, build a vehicle to solve the puzzle. So it's almost like they've kind of tried to blend World of Goo with those, maybe? Hmm. And then using the goo, the, like, the goo mechanic as the building mechanic as well. How strange. Not a bad idea. Not the worst idea I've ever heard of, no, certainly. Uh, we have Snowflake Tattoo, which is surreal looking, I think. I'm I not sure what to make of it. do not know what this is. It is the prequel to NPPD Rush, The Milk of the Ultraviolet. Which is certainly a name I recognize from Steam and I remember looking at just because it sounded so... <laughs> fucking insane, <laughs> quite frankly. Uh, and I don't think it was... Yeah, the MPPD MP MP Rush, the Milk of Ultraviolet, uh, which is actually only £2.99 on Steam and has mostly negative reviews. <laughs> <laughs> so. Which also was trippy as balls, and I have no idea what we're looking at. There's definitely some top-down shooter stuff in the first game, but, yeah, the second one... Fuck knows. These guys do some weird, weird stuff. Clearly, I imagine they probably got. It's one of. It's probably one of those companies that's kind of got a fairly dedicated fan base that will make whatever shit they throw out, and everybody else is just like, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
whatever. Uh, we have Ride, which is a motorcycle racing thing <coughs> with a very generic bland name. This is a full price title and I think by the looks of it they're bringing it on consoles as well in spite of the fact that it doesn't have a publisher. What? It's quite impressive. Um, very pretty looking. It's racing. I guess if you want motorbike racing, that's motorbike racing. Can't say it's anything that would appeal to me, but there's definitely a market out there for that. I am not it. Uh, and we have... Ugh, what the... F oh. uh. <laughs> <laughs> Really? Says, really? Is, this, is this not your title, John? Really? <laughs> the fact that it has... All, the title is Princess Evangel All Ages Version. <laughs> which tells you exactly what kind of game this is. <laughs> this is... Uh, a curious series of events lead our hero to become the only boy at a prestigious girls' academy. <laughs> oh, dear. This is a dating sim, and presumably, judging from all ages version, it's something that was considerably more explicit in other regions and other retailers, and they've cut a lot out to get it onto Steam. Which will, no doubt, disappoint quite a lot of the people who this <laughs> is actually aimed at in the first instance. Who, who are the kind of people who are playing the game for not, not for its compelling narrative, if we're honest. <laughs> So well, well, I guess if you are, if you ask them, they'd probably tell you it was the compelling narrative. But the porn helps. <laughs> <laughs> the porn always helps. <laughs> if it doesn't have the porn, it's not worth playing. <laughs> I believe is the argument. Not that I'm making it. Uh, Nightbanes. Nightbanes is a digital collectible card game in an alternate modern horror universe with vampire clans waging an endless war. Hey, you're right. There are vampires everywhere. Everywhere. Vampires the card game. Uh, I guess our good friend Alzarath would be the man to speak to about taking a look at that. I've no idea whether he has any plans to look at it, but if uh, anyone was going to do it, I think he'd be the man. He is the man with the cards. And this is cards. If you like cards, that's the thing. That'll bring us to the end, I suppose. That's all the Steam releases for the upcoming week. Actually, to be fair, it's not. This is the ones that are listed now. It invariably happens that over the course of the week, people actually put their games up. They don't actually put it up in advance. They just sort of put it up when their game launches. So there will be loads that we missed, but not much we can do about that. If you don't know, if they're not going to promote their game ahead of time, we can't talk about them. Whether it be good or bad. Oh, but anyway. Pleasure. Yes. Michael, would you like to take us out? Well, it's been so long, I'll have a damn good go. <laughs> You've forgotten how to do it. At this point. Oh, well, we're about to find out, boy. <laughs> Alrighty. We well, thank you very much for listening to the podcast. We really do appreciate it. Um, please feel free to subscribe or leave us a comment and uh, we'll look into it, I guess. <laughs> we'll, wow, you're really compelling the audience participation. Leave a comment and we'll look into it, I guess. Wow. If you leave something that's compelling enough, I will respond. Yeah. If you're just going to post drivel, I probably will read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. That's how it usually works. So it's like comments fall into two categories. Or I don't, I, there's, no, there's no comments that we get that I don't read, but... Uh, Alright, let me... You know, let if, you've got some, if you've got something to say, I'll talk back. Uh, if you, I'll rephrase that. Please feel free to subscribe or leave us a comment that John will read and reply to. I don't like the way you say I will. And do it again. <laughs> <laughs> no, carry on. <laughs> If you want to find out more about Buttermash, you can uh, follow, find us on Facebook at... Facebook.com forward slash Buttermash. Follow us on Twitter at... Twitter.com forward slash Button underscore Mash underscore UK. You can check out our website at... Button hyphen Mash dot net. You can find our podcast on YouTube and uh, other videos and content that we do at... The channel you're already on. Click the subscribe button below the bloody video. Yes, do it. <laughs> do it. <laughs> <laughs> Why have you not done it yet? <laughs> uh, and also, if, also, if you if you manage to get to this podcast without already being subscribed to the channel, please leave a comment and tell me how you got here because I'm really intrigued. <laughs> <laughs> yep, you, you're making notes of that audience. Good. Yep. Uh, See, so there's can... loads of opportunities to interact with us here today. It's fantastic. You can uh, find our presence at Steam at. 
the Steam curation page is bit.ly forward slash BM Steam, where we will obviously disclose all paid endorsements. <laughs> Speaking of which, if you would like to pay John to make YouTube exclusive content, you can find uh, his Patreon series at. Okay, you can find that at patreon.com forward slash button mash. Thank you very much. And your contributions are much appreciated. Once again, thank you very much for listening to the podcast. We truly do appreciate it. On behalf of myself and on behalf of John. Thank you. And on behalf of Will. Thank you. I'm Michael. This has been the Butter Mash Podcast. We'll see you next week. Goodbye. Bye. Very bye.